Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the online hydrogen conference hosted by Nido and Jetro. In session one on December the 2nd, we learned about government policies and actions that are building a clean energy future with hydrogen. Today, we will address the private sector's challenges and opportunities to expand the clean hydrogen industry. We have invited representatives of leading companies and organizations from the Pacific West in Japan. In a series of three panels, we will discuss fuel cells and vehicles they power, hydrogen fueling stations, and hydrogen power generation. We will also highlight case studies of commercially viable hydrogen projects. But first and foremost, I would like to start this session with Ms. Mel Clark and Ms. Rochelle Ames. Ms. Clark is president and CEO, and Ms. Ames is senior director of commercialization and outreach at the Clean Tech Alliance based in Seattle. They will be introducing the organization's activities and how it supports the clean tech sector in the US and Canada, especially for the hydrogen ecosystem. Ms. Clark and Ms. Ames, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. We're delighted to be here today learning alongside and from all of you about some of the great innovations that are happening in hydrogen. At the Clean Tech Alliance, we work every day to make connections that make a difference for our member companies through several of our programs. And our, our programs and our members focusing on creating a stronger, healthier environment and economy for uh, our region. We help our members advance clean technologies out of the lab setting. We provide educational and business development events, work with entrepreneurs, and help new companies grow and thrive. We advocate for policies to create business opportunity for clean technology, and we connect our members across multiple industries. Next slide, please. We work with more than a thousand member companies in a wide range of industry sectors. Uh, hydrogen is certainly a, a focus area for our state and is growing, but we work with members across many, many different industry verticals, uh, both within their verticals and helping connect them with others whom they can collaborate with. Next slide. And I'm going to go ahead and bring Rochelle on camera now. She is, works with a lot of our, our new members and our commercialization and our startup programs. And she'll talk a little bit more about our members and some of our new programs. Take it away, Rochelle. Thank you very much, Mel. And thank you um, to those that have put this conference on and allowing us to introduce the Clean Tech Alliance and, and our members really is what we want to focus on. So um, like Mel said, we have members in a lot of different industry vertical sectors. We also have member companies in a lot of different um, business types as well. So we, we work with our entrepreneurs that are starting up um, companies. Uh, we work with the capital uh, providers and funders. Uh, we work with those larger entities that could be their uh, customers or partners, uh, as well as government entities and, of course, our research institutions and national laboratories. We do that through um, quite a bit of different and varied work. Uh, one of the things that our member companies uh, enjoy most about the Clean Tech Alliance is that access to the variety of membership, both those industry verticals and business types. So we do a lot of networking and convening activities. We do um, activities around talent development and workforce, entrepreneur support systems, such as our Cascadia Clean Tech Accelerator that we do with our partners at Virtue Lab. And then we focus on advocacy and policy issues to help grow the clean tech ecosystem here in the United States um, and um, more specifically in Washington State. And then we also do a lot of conferences and events like this. So if you like things like this, please, please come talk with us. We'd love to chat with you more. Here's a uh, overview of our events and focus areas for uh, 2022. Uh, please feel free to use your phone's camera and you can scan our QR code if you'd like to learn more and see that, that events list. We're going to be focusing on, in 2022, energy, uh, the built environment, commercialization activities, uh, circular economy and clean materials, aviation sustainability, and agricultural technologies as well. Um, we love this quote from one of our startup um, startup um, um, 
companies from uh, Ceronics Renewable. Uh, really, this is this is the reason why the Clean Tech Alliance exists and what we look to do. We are trying to bring together a whole uh, supply chain and ecosystem here within the, the Pacific Northwest. And part of that is, is that we know that the way that we are going to build a thriving ecosystem for clean technologies and, and technologies like hydrogen is that you need um, a variety of people working on the problems. And that's what we bring together uh, during our events and networking and entrepreneur support programs and other programs in general um, with the Clean Tech Alliance. And one of those new programs uh, we'd like to talk about is a um, program that's been funded by the state of Washington. Uh, there are going to be six innovation cluster acceleration programs. Ours will be focused on decarbonizing the built environment. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on building on the success that we have as the Clean Tech Alliance. We have a lot of our member companies are already working in the built environment space, and we know that we can grow and focus on some more specific challenges uh, around decarbonizing uh, buildings and the systems in general. We're going to be doing that by accelerating competitive and affordable innovations, also supporting workforce and making sure that we are focused on technologies and solutions that are being going to be able to be accessed by all Washingtonians and so supporting those that um, have been historically underrepresented of underserved communities specifically. Here's some more information on how those focus areas will work. We'll work on research development and deployment, uh, talent development and workforce. We're going to be bringing together the best um, in decarbonizing, decarbonizing the built environment to Washington and focusing on those areas that Washington is already really good at um, and this region in general. Uh, we're gonna be developing markets and marketing um, our technologies. And then the lens throughout which all of what we will do will be on our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion focus. And again, serving and providing technologies and solutions to those that have been um, historically underrepresented uh, in the region. We will also, through this cluster, um, be focusing on connecting and into projects that are around a hydrogen hub. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mel to talk more specifically about um, who is working on hydrogen projects and how we plan on connecting with them into um, both the Clean Tech Alliance and this emerging cluster that we're working on. Thanks, Mel. Great. Thanks, Rochelle, for the overview of the cluster. Next slide, please. It's a very exciting time to be working on clean technology on our increasingly connected globe. Uh, certainly the uh, announcements and the work that came out of COP26 gives us all a lot to dig into and begin to work with to begin to create those solutions in our communities. Washington State's utilities have led the nation in developing hydrogen infrastructure. It's an exciting time to be working on hydrogen or looking to connect the hydrogen projects and Washington has a lot going on. Uh, Douglas County PUD is building a, a very large electrolyzer. Uh, Tacoma Power uh, has added an electricity tariff specific to uh, hydrogen and electrofuel production. production. Next slide. Uh, additionally, uh, our utilities are engaged in some very collaborative community projects that are working on creating hydrogen to help innovate our energy footprint. Uh, these are spanning urban and rural communities in the state, so we're excited to see that developing in, in more rural areas as well. Next slide. But where we really shine, and one of the things we're terribly excited about, several of the things we're terribly excited about is what our research institutions are working on. And I know at this conference, you, you'll have heard from Dr. Aaron Fever. Uh, I know he's speaking uh, or, or spoke at the first day of the, of the event about the JC Dream Charge Consortium. JC Dream is also one of the funded ICAP clusters that we'll be collaborating with very closely as we work to decarbonize the built environment. Uh, we're very, very proud of PNNL and all of their work on, on their hydrogen safety hub, uh, their DOE hydrogen and fuel cell technology office, and their H2 at scale vision. Additionally, Idaho National Lab, and, uh, who we also work with, uh, has a new incubator program launching in 2022 that will allow them to begin to test the creation of uh, hydrogen using a new SMR on site at their Idaho, Idaho Falls facility. Next slide, please. Uh, we're working with companies such as First Mode who are transforming mining and other large equipment over to uh, hydrogen power uh, and they've built some of the largest fuel cell production plants in the world in order to begin to do this. Very fascinating new technologies. We're looking forward to engaging with them and learning even more about that program next year. Next slide please. Mass transportation, we have Maritime Blue in the state working hard to explore um, hydrogen for large vessels and ferries. And we have companies in Washington state that are working on bringing hydrogen to aviation to help decarbonize a very difficult to decarbonize industry. Next slide. Oh. 
And we will continue to convene stakeholders across these sectors to help create hydrogen uh, as an emerging uh, hub here in Washington. There are many, many sectors that are keenly interested in creating hydrogen solutions uh, and working together to create that infrastructure so that, uh, as we like to say, all boats can rise together and that every sector that can stand to benefit from beginning to engage with hydrogen as a power source have the opportunity to collaborate and, and work together to solve some of those collective challenges to help make that happen. Feel free to reach out to Rochelle or myself at any time. Here's our contact information. If you have questions, want to learn more, uh, saw a company that we're working with, you'd like an introduction to that you're not connected with, we'd be happy to assist. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to join the event today. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark and Ms. Ames for your presentation. As you explained, the Queen Tech Alliance represents a large number of uh, member organizations in North America. Many Japanese corporations are looking for green, green tech startups to participate, partner with, and the Alliance would be a great partner in, in building this network. We hope to work with you again soon. Now, I would like to move on to the panel discussions. The first panel discussion deals with FCVs and fuel cells. Supply side and user side entities will discuss their experiences with hydrogen power vehicles, including on the advantages and essentials for developing a fleet in a commercially viable way. The panel will include a 30 minute discussion and audience Q&A. Before we get started, I would like to explain how to participate in this session. Anyone may submit questions to, to today's presenters through the question window in the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address as many of them as possible during the Q&A session. We have invited four panelists, Mr. Kohei Masaki, a hydrogen strategy consultant, Electrified Vehicle Technology Office, Toyota Motor North America, Mr. Philippe Gerritsen, Director, Cons Consumer Fueling Solutions, Nicola, Mr. Matthew Arms, Director of Environmental Planning, Port of Long Beach, and Mr. Ray Adams, Chief Operating Officer at First Mold. The panel moderator is Dr. Joseph Williams, Seattle Director for the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Williams without further ado. Thank you so much, and we're excited to be here. I will point out that Mel had mentioned that PNNL, which is my employer, and First Mode were two significant contributors to the Clean Tech Alliance. Um, we, uh, First Mode is a very exciting company, and I look forward to hearing what Ray Adam has to say about that. Uh, but we're going to start off with Masaki-san from uh, Toyota, who will be talking about uh, their company's uh, vehicle uh, strategy. Then we'll talk, then we'll have Phil Garriston talk, then we'll have Matt Arms, and then we'll finish up with Ray Adams from First Mode. So let's kick it off with Masaki-san. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Williams. Um, okay, my name is Kohei Masaki from Toyota North America. They, um, let me give a quick uh, presentation. Um, works. Um, <clears throat> before we go into the actual Q&A, please share what our company is now trying to do, expand the fuel cell business. Uh, outside of the traditional Toyota world. So my responsibility, oops, let's see. My responsibility of the Toyota is to um, expand the fuel cell business outside of the traditional Toyota world, which is the passenger vehicle or the trucks. Um, so such as uh, heavy duty trucks or bus or off-road equipment, Marines, everything is. So. Okay. 
So I don't know, can, can you guys see my screen? Sorry, I, I cannot check. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So um, let me start with a very high level, our company's goal toward 2050, which called the challenge 2050. But uh, basically we are challenging of achieving zero of on number one, two, three, you can see, and also the net positive impact challenges uh, for the green area. So out of here, one of the activity we are doing is what, uh, what uh, I'm responsible for in North America. And one of the key projects is the project portal we called. So starting from the initial prototypes back in 2017, announcement in Port of LA about the first prototype trucks you can see here in the top. And um, now we are also conducting the 10 truck pilot under our uh, California CARB funding project. And also uh, we are uh, aggressing, uh, uh, progressing toward the production intent uh, utilizing the latest field cell technology we call Gen 2, Generation 2 technology. And also this is the picture from the latest uh, CARB funding project. So utilizing one of the truck to hold the car uh, arriving to the port of Long Beach from uh, Japan or outside of the US and bring into the dealer, like Toyota dealer or Lexus dealer, uh, utilizing this truck as a car holder. And one of the uh, things, achievement we did uh, in this project is, you can see the light side is the diesel, typical diesel engine. And then the middle one, is uh, our FC uh, module, FC engine using for this truck. So trying to fit in the uh, existing uh, truck so that they uh, reduce uh, some hurdle for the each truck OEM to install our kit uh, to their truck. And also we just announced this year uh, starting to assemble those engines, FC engines, uh, in 2023 in our Kentucky plant. So that's the key project uh, now we are doing, but not only that, uh, we are uh, having this box type of the fuel cell system, you can see in the middle, to apply for the other application like a uh, stationary or a bus, a forklift or a cargo handling equipment or marine. So every project is uh, we are looking for to expand, uh, support the hydrogen ecosystem creation uh, in the US. And one of the other key um, project, uh, this is a prototype, but inside a port terminal in Los Angeles, this is the Phoenix Marine Service Terminal, but we developed one uh, UTR, uh, the yard tractor holding the container inside the terminal, not the on-road uh, truck, but inside the terminal. But this is also significant. In fact, we see to uh, support the terminal to be zero emission. And this is a picture from the actual work I'm doing. So still there's a uh, significant challenges to see expansion of the business of the hydrogen or fuel cell, like uh, uh, infrastructure or technology, total cost of ownership. But we believe as a Toyota to step by step to start off this kind of project to expand toward the uh, mid and long term future of the hydrogen in the US. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And let's over back to Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. A, a fascinating uh, portfolio of, of objectives there. Um, Phil, you're up next. Great. Well, thank you very much. My name is Philippe Gerritsen. I'm Director of Customer Fueling Solutions at Nikola. I'd like to thank Nito and Jetro for hosting the conference and inviting Nikola to participate. And thank you, Dr. Williams, for hosting. So moving on to our first slide, uh, we start every presentation here at Nikola with a focus on our values. We're very much interested as a relatively young company in driving forward, moving fast, working outward and acting as owners, but we always look to do so 
in a values-based approach. We act transparently, working closely uh, with partners and communicating our capabilities and our timelines and our expectations. We are very interested in collaboration. We have very ambitious goals uh, across the hydrogen ecosystem and with our battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks. And we recognize we can't do all of that on our own. And so we need the partnership of others in industry to help us support that. We also act with humility, um, really focusing on the recognition that we can't do everything on our own and what uh, acknowledging where we have challenges and where we can collaborate with others to accomplish our mutual objectives. And of course, throughout everything, we focus on safety and quality. There are, those are paramount and of utmost importance to us, particularly as we deal with hydrogen. And we wanna ensure that the quality that, of the products and the interactions that we have with our customers and with our collaboration partners as well throughout all of our interactions. So moving on to our mission, we at Nikola are dedicated to the transformation of the transportation industry. We are both a bat manufacturer of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks, but we have a full focus on zero emissions throughout our transportation solutions. And we also are building out an energy business to help facilitate the adoption of our hydrogen fuel cell trucks, where we're investing in hydrogen production, fueling stations, as well as battery charging solutions to support our customers behind the fence needs. And, uh, to enable a widespread adoptive network to enable operational flexibility for our customer fleets. <clears throat> Looking at our uh, product uh, lineup, we have three models of trucks that we're bringing to market. We have our Tray Bev, which is our first product to market, which is available now. It's a uh, fully electric, battery electric, uh, class eight semi tractor trailer. It has a 350 mile range and is really oriented towards local and regional hauling um, that can accommodate the time to charge. We also will have our first fuel cell day cab class A tractor, the Trey fuel cell, which will be coming to market around 2023. And we'll have an expected range of about 500 miles. This is also going to be applicable for regional operations where uh, typically we'll be looking at return to base type operations. But it has the advantage in that there's higher payload capacities as well as longer ranges and less time required for fueling that enables uh, various operations that have high duty cycle requirements for the trucks. And finally, around 2025, 26 timeframe, we'll be looking to debut our Nicholas Sleeper, the two, which will enable long haul transportation across the nation uh, with a 900 mile range that will really enable those uh, overnight types of transportation solutions to facilitate uh, continent-wide transportation. Moving on to our energy solutions. On the hydrogen side, we are advancing a entire ecosystem in order to facilitate the low cost, total cost of ownership for hydrogen fuel cell trucks. We are investing in hydrogen production capabilities with key uh, partnerships uh, to build out hydrogen production facilities uh, throughout the U.S. and Canada, we've made announcements with TC Energy to co-invest in hydrogen production hubs. We've secured a rate with Arizona Public Service Company that we will uh, utilize to produce green electrolytic hydrogen for the California market. And we've made an investment into Wabash Valley resources that will allow us to produce hydrogen cost effectively in the Midwest. We're also tackling the distribution of hydrogen finding partners that can support us in the transportation of hydrogen, both via tanker trailer and via pipeline in the long term to support low cost deliveries from our hydrogen production hubs to the network of fueling stations that we're looking to deploy. On the dispensing side, those hydrogen fueling stations are a key focus of ours, where we're trying to build out a corridor network of fueling stations that will allow for operational flexibility for our customers initially starting along the West Coast, building out a corridor with the focus on California initially and expanding from there, but eventually expanding nationwide and being able to provide a competitive total cost of ownership to our customers throughout the US and Canada, as well as in Europe. To complement the uh, vehicles and the energy side of the business, we're also developing and growing our dealership network this allows us to uh, get our customers to see, touch and feel our trucks and to realize the seamless operational capabilities of these vehicles into their existing operations. 
It also allows us to provide a high quality level of service that our customers expect to maintain the high utilization of their trucks, since these vehicles need to be available around the clock to serve those customers' business requirements. Moving on to the complete package. We're providing our hydrogen fuel cell trucks under a complete total cost of ownership lease that mitigates some of the higher costs up front associated with the purchase of a fuel cell truck while bundling sales of hydrogen fuel as well as the service for the vehicles over the life of the assets. By doing this, we mitigate those upfront costs, but also secure the demand needed in order to build out hydrogen production facilities and to make the capital investments in the entire distribution and fueling network required for us to be able to enable the market uh, market-wide adoption of these hydrogen fuel cell trucks. In partnership with Aveco, we're bringing forward a truck that has uh, really reliable uh, capabilities. We have a high quality customer service that will keep those trucks running for the full life of the assets. And we have the energy side of the business that will provide us with low cost fuel. Altogether, we have a competitive total cost of ownership that will allow for the rapid adoption of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, throughout the ecosystem and allow for uh, making a real impact in reducing emissions in heavy transportation. Thank you. Terrific presentation, Philippe. Um, my first question will be, no, I'm not asking it yet, but my first question for you and Masaki-san will be, what collaboration do you need from the public sector in order to realize this vision? So think about that as we tee up Matt uh, to talk about the port of Long Beach, what's going on with hydrogen there. Matt. Good afternoon. Can you hear me fine? Yep. All right, let me share my screen, hopefully. And can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So um, thank you for having me this afternoon. I think um, for my brief presentation, I'm going to start off for those that aren't familiar with the Port of Long Beach, I'm gonna give a little background of who we are and why we're interested in zero emission and hydrogen technologies and let you know a little bit about our journey um, to help with the conversation. So first of all, um, the Port of Long Beach, we are the second largest bit, um, container port in the United States. Um, the first largest is the Port of Los Angeles, our next door neighbor. And together, the two ports bring in 40% of the containerized cargo that comes into the United States. And so the first question I usually get is, why is that? And the reason is, one, we have a very large local population that is um, demanding goods from Asia. In addition, we are the fastest route for containerized trade to get from Asia to all of the United States. And therefore, the ports of LA and Long Beach are a, a um, tremendous gateway um, for goods movement. So for the Port of Long Beach, that translated in 2020 to 8.11 million TEUs. And to just explain a little lingo, this is how we kind of measure our volume. A TEU is a 20 foot equivalent unit. So if you think of a container, a truck, that is a 40 foot would be two of those. So that means that in 2020, we had basically 4 million um, containers or trucks worth of um, containers go through the Port of Long Beach. And that translates to about $200 billion worth of goods that go through the Port of Long Beach each year. And then it's about the same in Los Angeles. And um, as the congestion has showed, um, you know, the Port of LA and Long Beach, we truly are um, a national asset that is critical to the um, efficient flow of goods throughout the country. In addition, we are a local economic engine. Like I said, $200 billion worth of goods pass over our um, docks each year. That translates to 51,000 jobs in the city of Long Beach are attributed to the Port of Long Beach. That's 575,000 jobs throughout the county, 705,000 in California, and another 2.6 million jobs nationwide. So we truly are a, a really important national asset as well as economic engine. But all of that economic success, and even though we're so critical um, to goods movement, we realize that that comes at a cost. And importantly, it comes at a cost to both the environment and the local community around us. Um, the 
the impact of goods movement through these this key gateway is having a disproportionately impact on um, air quality and the health of the residents of Long Beach. And recognizing that in 2005, our Board of Harbor Commissioners adopted the Greenport policy. And the Greenport policy's aim is to reduce the impacts of port operations and development and development on the local community and on the environment overall. And so after the adoption of the Greenport policy in 2005, it was followed up with the adoption of our joint Clean Air Action Plan with the Port of Los Angeles. And the Clean Air Action Plan laid out strategies to reduce emissions, and we're talking criteria pollutants here, diesel particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, um, from port operations in order to um, improve air quality and the health of the local community. And the, 2000, the, the original Clean Air Action Plan was extremely successful. Um, and every year we um, measure our progress and do a, a comprehensive emissions inventory. And in 2020, diesel particulate matter was down 90%, nitrogen oxides were down 62%, um, SOx was down 97%, and greenhouse gases were down 10%. Um, from 2005 baseline levels. So we have really made a lot of progress. But we understand that that is not enough. We need to do more to protect the environment um, and, and particularly address climate change as well as the health of the communities around us. So in 2017, our Board of Harbor Commissioners, um, our Board of Harbor Commissioners um, adopted a Clean Air Action Plan 2017 update with very ambitious goals to be have zero emission terminal equipment, and you saw some of that in the previous slide, by 2030, and zero emission dredge trucks, the heavy duty trucks by 2035. The port of Long Beach, as well as Los Angeles, we are technology and fuel neutral. We set the goal, which is zero um, pipe, end of pipe emissions um, by 2030 um, for CHE and um, 2035 for trucks. And then it's up to the operator to figure out what suits them best, what technology suits them best. We are not operators, we're a landlord port, so we don't op own or operate the equipment ourselves, but what we can do is help advance the technology. And that's what we've done over the last 16 years, whether it was originally cleaning up the diesel equipment and now moving into zero emission equipment, we can help demonstration projects, we can help in advocacy for funding to push the um, technology towards commercialization. And so as we look ahead, um, we are currently undergoing um, of roughly $70 million in um, grants for demonstrations. Um, That's probably another $70 million. The $70 million represents the grants. There's another $70 million probably in, um, in uh, partner investment. So $150 million in um, demonstrating zero emission technologies. To date, um, with the exceptions that were shown earlier, the vast majority of it has been battery electric, but that doesn't mean hydrogen isn't going to play a key role. If you look at the um, source categories that we have, we look at addressing emissions from heavy duty, um, heavy duty trucks, our drayage trucks, cargo handling equipment, vessels and harbor craft, as well as trains. Of those groups, um, hydrogen is definitely most advanced in the heavy duty sector with the class eight trucks. Um, and then followed up by car cargo handling equipment where some demonstrations are going um, on and we hope for more in the future. I think that we see harbor craft, tugboats going around the harbor as a real opportunity for hydrogen. Um, those types of vessels present real challenges for battery electric. If you can imagine you have a tugboat, um, you don't necessarily want or <laughs> have the room or the capacity to put a lot of batteries on it. So hydrogen could definitely um, play a key role with harbor craft. So that's something we're pursuing as well as for locomotives. So as we move forward, I think that there is a lot of interest in pursuing um, additional technologies and, and demonstrations with hydrogen. Um, we at the Port of Long Beach absolutely support it as a technology and a fuel choice that um, will be one of the tools in the toolbox. I will say that one of the keys for um, the te hydrogen technology moving forward at the at least the Port of Long Beach will be reduction in cost and also the increase in renewable hydrogen. Um, or, or green hydrogen, even more than renewable. Um, even though we, we measure our, our standard at the tailpipe, we don't want to switch um, emissions um, at the tailpipe for emissions at another source. So it'll really be important that whatever hydrogen is used to fuel the equipment um, has a very low carbon in impact. So with that, um, I look forward to the discussion. 
Thanks, Matt. Great presentation. Lots of questions I have, but we'll wait on that. Um, next up is Ray Adams. First Mode is the only one of the presenters I've actually had a chance to tour. Their story is absolutely fascinating. So, Ray, uh, moving over to you. Sure thing. Uh, we'll uh, try to do the same here. Um, so, First Mode is a Seattle-based uh, engineering team. Uh, we work on a variety of problems, um, really focused in two areas. The first is in uh, heavy, heavy duty. Uh, so there's, I think the heavy duty and then there's the, um, ultra class mining vehicles. Um, we focus on, um, the conversion, uh, and ground up redesign of, um, heavy industrial vehicles and platforms for zero emission. That includes both batteries, hydrogen, supercapacitors, overhead trolley lines, a little bit of anything and everything. Um, and we also do work in the uh, deep space exploration uh, side of the house, um, most of which are also zero emission systems. Uh, they ha just happen to rely on solar and or plutonium in the case of the Perseverance rover you see on the screen there, um, rather than hydrogen and batteries, but still a really important part of what we do every day to push um, the technology to its very limit and to incorporate larger and larger uh, versions of these systems into the um, really utility scale um, two to 10 megawatt type systems into mobile platforms, um, both retrofitting and reverse engineering the systems that they go into, uh, as well as building our own from scratch where necessary, um, really across the system. And I, I think, you know, something certainly all of the panelists are touching on, this is a ecosystem type problem. Um, and that's really where we draw on our systems heritage from spacecraft creation. Um, so when we look at a problem, um, we try to remain as the technology broker for our customers and clients, helping them guide through what is decidedly an evolving ecosystem, um, doing things for the first time often and, and helping them through that, both with product selection and techno-economic modeling, um, all the way through thinking through refueling um, transportation, and even all the way to hydrogen production, working on some of the U.S.'s largest hydrogen production projects for some of our partners in Australia, um, all the way down into the application engineering, certainly with the mining and metal sector, uh, where we're designing, building, and deploying uh, prototypical demonstrations for now, uh, up into pilot fleets and uh, larger scale production uh, on some of those vehicles with Anglo-American um, and, and others. First mode focuses on helping our customers at the very source of their problem, um, starting with back of napkin type sketches, working through design of their system to fit very specific needs, and then bringing that into existence in the physical world and doing demonstrations at site. In the case of some of the large scale power module systems, we're also taking that next step into production um, alongside our clients uh, to make sure that they're able to meet their own very aggressive targets for zero emission. Uh, that's true in the uh, heavy haulage arena, also true in locomotive and maritime, um, certainly the folks at the port and elsewhere, but also looking at um, standalone applications and uh, potentially even into, into the aerospace sector. Uh, so what you can see here on the screen uh, is one of those projects, a 2.4 megawatt system. Um, about half and half hybridization between batteries. You'll see those large silver boxes at the, the right-hand side. Those are lithium ion batteries. And then eight um, fuel cells uh, that typically would power one city bus each. Uh, we've put them together into a large system uh, and then shipped that off to South Africa where Anglo-American is uh, busy with our team incorporating that into a uh, Komatsu 930E platform at a, one of the largest platinum mines on the planet. Uh, and that will be um, taking its first motion here in the next week or so uh, as the team finishes hooking up all of the harnessing and uh, everything else that broke inside the system uh, when we decided to remove the diesel generator. Um, our team is primarily based here in Seattle where we do the majority of our design, integration, and test. We also have a growing presence in Perth, West Australia that serves the mining and metal sector more directly and are um, rapidly growing around the globe to be better serving customers at their point of need, given the size and scale of the uh, products that we deliver. 
uh, putting them on a boat is uh, always less desirable than creating them on site. So um, growing with certainly the ecosystem around us as more and more people find the right applications for these technologies, uh, we're here to help folks guide through that process and deliver products that are going to uh, help close that from a system standpoint. That's first mode uh, in a nutshell. Um, I'll leave the space stuff for another time in another conference, uh, although lots of exciting things there as well. So back to you, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. So by, and we're right on time. So by virtue of being the moderator, I'm gonna assert privilege and ask the first question. And the question is, as I've already uh, telegraphed, I really wanna know how much support from the public sector do we need or expect in order to realize the hydrogen economy? And it'd be great to start off with Toyota and Nikola uh, to see what they're expecting or desiring. So Misaki-san. Yep, thanks, and that's a really good question. So um, like a public sector support role is significant, I think, for this kind of new technology. And in order to accelerate uh, the adoption of the new technology, uh, both regulation and uh, funding to support that is really key. And for the field soul, the new thing is not only the hardware or software side of the vehicle or the application, but also the infrastructure. So that's really key to happen that um, the hydrogen uh, from the molecule perspective um, uh, to support that from the CAPEX, OPEX things. Uh, that that's um, really, really um, key to be successful in the, uh, this world, we believe. Do you think that's a follow-up question? Is that true in fleet operations as well? Or would you expect the fleet operator to provide some of their own infrastructure? Um, that um, depends, like a diesel or current world, some operators, like a large operator, have their own diesel uh, uh, fueling infrastructure and also the maintenance service support, I think. So uh, toward the long term, I think that's uh, very helpful from the fleet or owner or operator or large fleets to have their own fueling infrastructure. But in the maybe the short term, um, uh, I think um, both uh, like a public, uh, sorry, public infrastructure over the road, we can split the usage also very important, I think. But also some, yeah, some fleets, if they're interested in uh, hydrogen for the large scale of the uh, installment of their fleets, I think the hydrogen infrastructure at their site is also a <clears throat> good option, we believe. Great. Philippe, what do you think? Yeah, I think we're pretty well aligned with Toyota on this. Um, one of the key aspects with hydrogen uh, for the heavy duty applications is that unlike existing diesel vehicles, we need to go and build an entire new fueling network and infrastructure in order to support the adoption of heavy duty trucks. So what that requires is that we need the government support in order to be able to build enough economies of scale that this industry can get off the ground and build uh, enough momentum to be self-sustaining. So in the early days, the higher technology costs that we're dealing with, the types of incentives that exist for the deployment of heavy duty vehicles through CARB's HIP program, for example, as well as for the deployment of fueling infrastructure, those help with mitigating those higher costs relative to what you have on the diesel side and it spur adoption in the early days so that economies of scale can help with the cost decline over time. As enough demand occurs, you're gonna see further and further cost declines also in the supply of fuel along with that, which will further then reinforce the development of the overarching demand for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and fuel supply. So from our perspective, we really approach this from a network and ecosystem approach where we look to engage with local market uh, players. So the local ports, the government agencies, the planning agencies, air quality management districts, and look to build out a network approach to the deployment of the hydrogen fuel cell trucks 
as well as the fueling infrastructure with supply from our hydrogen production hubs that can support that. And by doing so, we build enough economies of scale locally that we can justify investments in fueling infrastructure and build out the network of hydrogen fueling stations that create enough operational flexibility so that fleets can utilize those vehicles wherever they choose to operate today and have that truly seamless experience. But it's really important that that funding exists in the early days to help mitigate some of the higher upfront costs that are seen and help spur that demand and really build that momentum. Leap, are you thinking that's going to be federal or state by state? What's your approach? Obviously, federal incentives help in that it opens up a much larger market. But when you look at the current play of regulations, various states have specific uh, regulations and policies that differentiate themselves from others. So some of the key tools in the toolkit that exist are um, grant funding opportunities or uh, programs like the HRIP that provide for reduced cost for the vehicle purchases. But others that are really impactful are going to be advanced clean trucks regulations, which are probably more broadly adoptable in other states in that it doesn't create a specific cost that has to be paid out for the adoption of the trucks. Other key aspects that are really helpful are things like a low carbon fuel standard that recognizes the low carbon intensity associated with the fuel going into the vehicles, as that then helps I differentiate the value that hydrogen provides from an environmental perspective as compared to other fuels like CNG, for example. At the federal level, we're still looking for further changes such as getting hydrogen on equal footing as uh, renewable natural gas, for example, in that hydrogen currently isn't on the renewable fuel standard uh, administered by the EPA and is so at, at a disadvantage when compared to renewable natural gas. But we are uh, very, uh, we're looking forward to the positive steps being taken by the current plans for the uh, infrastructure package, as well as the um, proposals to look at a 30% investment tax credit for zero emission heavy duty trucks, um, as well as the further deployment of both battery electric and hydrogen fueling infrastructure nationwide, and feel that that will really be supportive of the deployment of fueling stations into other states and regions beyond the, the West Coast at this point in time. Great insight, both of you. So let's go to the questions from the audience. Uh, first question is from Kenneth Dragoon. He's asking, what is the efficiency of commercially available fuel cells in terms of kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen? Very specific question. Um, anybody want to field that one? I unfortunately am not prepared to answer that specific of a, a question. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, yeah, as third also, we not we're not just ready to disclose those kind of information uh, yet. But I'm happy to discuss time by time if there's any uh, specific interest uh, from anyone. Please reach out to me. Got it. I understand uh, uh, the nature of competitive information. Next question is from Will Salem. Will is asking, what do you recommend to companies that are trying to enter the fuel cell and electrolyzer market as material suppliers? I think that's a, it's pretty open-ended. Um, I would say that, um, you got to find opportunities to develop partnerships with key um, sources of demand for your fuel cells and electrolyzers, right? Um, from our standpoint, we're always looking for the best possible equipment manufacturers and that can provide high quality products with dependable warranties and that will be able to uh, last for the life of our trucks and in the heavy applications. Um, Cost is also an important factor in terms of um, trying to achieve parity from a total cost of ownership standpoint. Um, so we're always looking for new opportunities to collaborate on um, equipment supplies um, for our trucks or for our uh, hydrogen production or fueling station uh, needs. Great, anyone else? All right, 
Thank you. We'll move on to Matt. Art, this is from Hiro Yoshimura. Are you willing to develop bunker facilities of the variety of renewable fuel uh, like Rotterdam has done? Um, sure. So, th so that's a good question. And, and this is always the tough question. It's a little bit of the chicken and an egg, right? In order to have, um, uh, to, to, in order to, to build the supply, you need, you need people wishing to purchase it. And we, we've gone through this with like LNG, LNG bunkering, um, for example. You know, for years we've been um, asked if, if LNG bunkering is going to come to the port of Long Beach um, and, and by um, shippers and um, uh, bunkers ask, well, when, when are the ships coming, right? And so I, I think a long story short is we will always look to provide um, the facilities that our customers need in order to continue calling the Port of Long Beach. Um, we're currently, um, we do have LNG um, ships coming soon. If, if there's other types of fuel um, sources that um, our, our customers want and, and want to be fueled in, in Long Beach rather than at another port of call, we'll definitely entertain that. Um, we do have interest um, from... Um, uh, suppliers that are looking at the Port of Long Beach and other ports for other types of um, uh, vessel fuels. So that's always conversations we're willing to have and explore. Excellent. Thank you. Philippe, question for you. Probably an easy question. Does Nicola plan to integrate the Canadian market into your plans? Yeah, we are looking at uh, the U.S., Canada, and the EU at this point as far as the markets that we're uh, pursuing. Question from Eric Sedlak for everyone. It seems like hydrogen is well suited to shipping, truck transport, and aircraft where batteries are inherently impractical. Um, but where they are practical, how well will hydrogen compete uh, for renewable energy uh, against battery powered vehicles? I'm happy to start there with some thoughts and, and let folks take it from there. I think one of the first things, and, and certainly when we're starting on a new application that we look at is, what is the right valid balance of hybridization to achieve the right business outcome for folks? You know, diesel is a phenomenal fuel source and there's no way around that. You can be a little bit lazy in your operations and um, you don't have to fully understand every part of the day-to-day -day movement of a fleet of operations uh, where you're losing a little bit of an efficiency. Uh, that is definitely not the case with hydrogen or batteries for that matter. And um, for us, when we look at it, a lot of the modeling and simulation work we do is to answer that question is, is this a battery only version or is this a hydrogen only version or are we somewhere in the middle here and why do we need to do that? And a great example, um, even with um, Anglo-American who has mine sites spread around the globe, um, the specific routes that those haul trucks are driving make a tremendous difference in the balance of hybridization that will deploy where um, the platinum mine in South Africa is, uh, is a pretty good balance between the two. Um, a mine where you're mining at the very top of a mine, such as the uh, Andes Mountains in, the, in Chile, um, you're bringing ore down fully loaded. You want to really maximize the amount of energy you're able to retain in the system through regenerative braking. And so you are naturally preferenced towards a system that uses a little bit more battery uh, than you do hydrogen as those two really do play against each other for volume and space and weight and cost. Um, and uh, you're always going to have new edge cases within that and you have to make decisions about your operations. You know, do you really need to meet exact uh, operational constraints that you've been operating with today? Or can you change the way refueling's happening or recharging's happening with the way that your staff is taking breaks and, and that can make a big difference. Um, that, uh, that for a long time, I think, especially at the highest uh, levels of industrial application is going to be more one-off than it will be standardized. Um, but certainly as you start to think about applications around paved roads and known geographies and routes, uh, you can start to, to make a little bit of um, a distinction between those two forms of energy. But, at the end of the day, right, it's, it's onboard storage uh, and it's um, peak power requirements that are driving a lot of that. And um, that is gonna be a little bit different by customer. Uh, and I think that's, that's okay. That complexity can be articulated and it can be understood uh, and it can be incorporated into iterations on a very similar product. 
Matt, how, how are the Port of, of Long Beach's stakeholders going to do the battery versus hydrogen equation? So I think that that's what they're all looking at. And, and I, I agree with the, the comments that were just made that, that everybody's going through their own evaluation process of trying to match that right um, duty cycle and demand with the right tool, right? With the right, with the right fuel, whether it's battery electric or, or hydrogen. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're on the road, um, we're demonstrating a lot of equipment now, and it happens to be focused on battery electric for a variety of reasons. But hydrogen, you know, players are starting to come in and demonstrate more. And I do think as um, those demonstrations go forward and we see more hydrogen equipment um, uh, coming on the terminals or in the drage trucks, the, their niche will become evident, right? You know, you have, there was a picture shown earlier of a, a top handler, the big, huge, um, uh, basically forklifts that have to pick up these these heavy containers. That's a megawatt battery, right? Is a megawatt battery the right solution or does hydrogen make more sense there for drage trucks that need a longer haul? Um, you know, there, there definitely is an argument to be made that hydrogen can get that truck a lot farther than a in, than a battery can, you know, with weight considerations and all of that. So, I, so I, I think that as we that that's why we do the demonstration. So as we go through this, the right solution can be matched to the right operation, and and, and that's what they're looking at. One more thing that they're really looking at, I think, our terminals is resilience too. Is you know what. what do I want to be, you know, do I want to be plugged into the grid and rely on the grid or do I want to have options, options like a more traditional in, in some sense, um, hydrogen fueling. Um, and so those are considerations as well. Yeah. I'll echo what Matt said there. I mean, we've got fleets operating in the port of Long Beach, like TTSI, for example, who we were planning on doing demonstration pilots with both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for them to figure out which one works best for their use case. Um, we're gonna have both of those operating around Q1 and Q2 of next year. And um, from those learnings, they're gonna decide which way they go. But their initial hesitancy around battery electric was whether there is sufficient time for them to charge when they double shift the trucks and try to keep them running around the clock. So um, time will show kind of how it works best for their business as to whether the battery electric truck works better or for the hydrogen fuel cell truck given the higher payloads and um, faster time to fuel. All right, Philippe, Philippe, I've got another question for you. This is from Janice Lynn. Curious about what your priority regions are for targeting the fueling infrastructure. We're currently focused on those regions which have the best regulatory environment to support hydrogen uh, from a total cost of ownership perspective. Um, we're trying actively to open up new markets that will support uh, adoption of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, but obviously, I mean, everybody knows California is the hotbed right now. And so we're actively seeking to do demonstrations and pilots in the state of California in order to support the adoption of those vehicles there. Um, but we're rapidly looking at those next markets that will allow us to achieve the um, the sale of all the trucks that we plan on producing because we do, we are a fully zero emission truck manufacturer and um, we want to find homes for all of these vehicles uh, nationwide and into Canada and the EU as well. Great. Open question from Mitch Ewan. Uh, what is the role of liquid hydrogen in the future? I can take that one. Um, we see liquid hydrogen as a valuable uh, form of hydrogen for the transportation of it, at least in the near term. Um, we're pursuing a hub and spoke approach for the development of our hydrogen production facilities and for the distribution of fuel to our distributed spokes of fueling stations. And so having hydrogen in liquid form allows us much greater flexibility in how we transport that hydrogen over longer distances, as well as reducing the on-site energy consumption associated with our fueling stations you look at about four times as much fuel being transported per tanker trailer in liquid form, and you have about a sixth as much energy at your fueling stations if you're doing it in liquid versus gaseous form. So um, from that perspective, liquid is a very efficient uh, carrier for us from an economic standpoint. However, long term, we expect that we're going to make a return to gas gaseous form um, as a result of investments that can be made once you achieve higher uh, market demand for hydrogen 
into pipelines that can allow for the much more efficient transportation of, that, of hydrogen in gaseous form over those longer distances. And some of the more extreme um, applications, certainly in, in the natural resources sector, you know, we think for onboard storage as well, you know, very important for completing some of the uh, operations that are um, uh, top of mind for our customers and clients too. So starting with gaseous, certainly on um, the pilot fleet uh, down, down in South Africa, um, we're doing our own demonstrations of liquid. Uh, the picture of the race car you saw will be racing the Baja 1000 uh, with a liquid hydrogen vehicle uh, for storage. Um, that's really critical on a thousand mile range uh, off-road type environment, uh, not necessarily as practical or as cost effective as you can get from storage solutions in the gaseous phase today. Um, we're also looking at how to move towards gaseous or liquid hydrogen storage on board um, some of the more massive earth moving platforms um, so that their efficiency is not just meeting what they're getting with diesel, but surpassing it and allow them to run for longer shifts without needing to stop and refuel um, for them, you know, even five minutes stopped makes a huge difference in the amount of ore they can haul and the amount of total platinum output at these operations. And um, so I do think you have these kind of niche applications that really require the cutting, the cutting edge, uh, and they'll help drive down costs and bring some of those technologies to bear in other industries where, you know, that five minute break might not make as big of a difference to, uh, to a truck driver as it might to someone um, hauling, hauling ore. Thanks. I already said, you want to say like our Nikola trucks, despite what I said about distribution via liquid, um, they will be fueling with 700 bar gaseous on board. Um, we are evaluating options for extended ranges down the road with liquid, but at this point it's all gaseous. Philippe, uh, follow on question. I mean, obviously a truck driver can't do a 900 mile shift, but an autonomous truck could. How, how does that play into your thinking? Uh, it's on the roadmap. We'll put, put it that way. Okay, fair enough. Um, new question from Vanadia Yasala. What is the challenging side of the hydrogen ecosystem in terms of the materials required for fueling system inside of the machinery or the body of the machinery, uh, especially for heavy duty machinery like a truck or a forklift or uh, a mining vehicle. There are a lot. <laughs> um, refueling, I mean, refueling in general is one of those areas that I think is still very much um, under development. I think the fuel cells, you know, is technology that's well known. Uh, the storage, while somewhat expensive, and certainly as you're getting up to higher pressures like 700 bar, uh, that Nikola is doing, um, you're starting to really push the technology to its limits. The refueling side, especially fast refueling for dumping, um, you know, enormous amounts of hydrogen safely in an industrial environment repeatedly when people are tired, um, that's an area that still has work to go to raise the um, technology readiness levels to something that um, is commercially viable for mass production and adoption. And there are great solutions out there today um, they will increasingly need to advance themselves to, to get the types of flow rates, to get the amount of energy on board. These systems that people are going to need as, you know, as they're not just picking the low hanging fruit application, they're starting to really touch the edge cases of what, um, what their operations need to see. Um, you know, I'm very excited and we're very excited to be learning about folks from three people in a garage to, you know, major companies that are making investments in hydrogen refueling, uh, it's going to be one of the areas that can really make or break uh, how an operation incorporates the technology. Matt, follow on question. How are you going to deal with hydrogen at scale uh, at the port? So, um, hydrogen, you mean if, if it, it becomes the, a, a larger dominant fuel source? Correct. I, I think that that's, that's absolutely part of um, what's going on now, both on the hydrogen and the battery electric side. What is the infrastructure needed, right? And, and what would that look like providing it in, in large quantity? Um, 
that's as much as the equipment and the technology on the equipment is of a focus to us, the infrastructure is of equal focus to us. So one of the things we're definitely looking at and as we're starting to look at um, doing master planning for ZE infrastructure for the terminals is one, understanding what that mix is gonna be and then two, understanding what that infrastructure looks like. I will say that I, I think that just like from a permitting standpoint and from a safety aspect, I think, um, you know, those that have responsibility over it have become a lot more comfortable um, with hydrogen. Um, and, I, and I think that it is, definitely there will be a process to go through, but I think that it is a process that's becoming much more familiar um, and with, with fire departments, for example. Um, but there the are same challenges we're having on the electrical side too, whether it's a new electric charger or, you know, something where we're still having to go through those same educational processes and demonstrations to, to make people comfortable. Okay. Next question comes from Nico Bocamp. What recommendations and lessons learned do you have to make the adoption and implementation of hydrogen fueling infrastructure, specifically stations, production and distribution, move faster than the conventional pace of implementation? In other words, uh, how, how, based on what you know so far, how do you accelerate things? Yeah, I mean, from Nico's perspective, that's where we're taking everything from this ecosystem approach. We're trying to build the demand while we build the supply so that they can go hand in hand with one another. And uh, by building the demand and having the sale of the trucks, we can understand where our customers are going to be and where we need to deploy fueling infrastructure to support their needs. However, the challenge that we face is that we have different timelines for the purchase of trucks and the production of trucks as compared to the uh, development of fueling infrastructure. W infrastructure is probably going to take two years or so to build out. Hydrogen production facilities, you're looking at least three or more years. Whereas to go and purchase a truck, that decision is often made on the order of several months. So from that standpoint, we have to take an iterative approach, working with our customers to understand what their timelines are for procuring trucks, work with government agencies in order to support the risk mitigation early in the development process of the infrastructure and uh, get the support of the ports and other entities that are looking to host these vehicles and these uh, infrastructure projects so that we can help um, with the uh, understanding of what the potential demand is outside of just our customers since we want to have public fueling stations available to any OEM. Uh, Toyota, you guys are welcome to come fuel our stations. Um, and to... Uh, go and uh, allow us to then make those capital investments that we need to with the de-risking from uh, government funding support, uh, de-risking from fleet commitments, et cetera, in order to uh, allow us to invest those capital dollars and ensure that the entirety of the uh, hydrogen ecosystem is ready by the time that the trucks actually hit the road and customers take possession of them. I, th I think that's right. And I, I would just add that while it may take a while, and it's especially if you're, you're purchased a hydrogen truck to put in the hydrogen and infrastructure, from what we're seeing, it could still be a lot faster than getting the um, uh, electrical infrastructure for battery electric rolled out like on a regional basis, right? And so that could be um, one of the advantages that pushes hydrogen along is that um, the infrastructure could potentially be rolled out quicker than... Um, for battery electric or charging. Does Absolutely. California, does California uh, live up to its reputation as the leader in hydrogen? I would say in, uh, in many ways, yes. Uh, there's certainly um, a lot of emphasis on battery electric as has been alluded to previously. Uh, and I mean, obviously that's the first product that's made it to the market. And so that's where a lot of the attention is today. But um, to Matt's point, we're going to face a lot of challenges as we try to deploy larger concentrations of battery electric vehicles and the impacts that that's going to have on the electrical grid. We're talking thousands of new megawatts of renewable generation that's going to have to be built, new transmission lines with NIMBYism that uh, prevents the uh, permitting and siting of transmission lines to get that uh, power from where the renewables are into the urban areas where the demand will be. Um, and so those are going to be significant challenges to overcome. 
Uh, and to Matt's point, with hydrogen, we can have a transportable fuel. We can utilize existing infrastructure as well, uh, converting existing natural gas lines, for example, to transport that fuel um, more cost effectively and um, in a more energy dense manner to the end uses um, without having to make as many large capital investments into new infrastructure that can be quite time consuming to deploy. Okay, next question came, comes from Mark Kirby. Could the panelists comment on ammonia versus LH2 for offshore marine power or as a hydrogen carrier for export? And his follow on question is, how about for on land or inshore marine? So I, I guess I will very, very briefly just say that um, we have started to hear, you know, thoughts of using um, ammonia, um, renewable ammonia for um, vessels. I, I think it's very much um, in the very, very early stages. Um, you know, LNG has been kicking around for a long time and we're just going to see our first LNG ship arrive this month. So I, I think that on the vessel side, it, it takes a long time to work this stuff through. What I'll say is, um, at Nikola, we're not currently really evaluating too many opportunities associated with importing hydrogen in ammonia form from overseas. Uh, we see that there's plenty of opportunities for cost-effective production here in North America itself. Um, and for land-based applications, we primarily envision hydrogen remaining in its base state, either as gas or liquid form. Um, with applications for ammonia primarily being as a form in which hydrogen can be transported over um, ocean-wide distances, basically. Okay, I have a question for Sasaki-san. Uh, uh, what's the time frame for interstate hydrogen refueling infrastructure and who will be the key player? Will it be the government? the hydrogen producers, the companies like Toyota or Nikola, who, what's the time frame look like? masaki said. Time frame for, um, sorry, what, what, what's the question again? Time frame the for time the frame for having production. the infrastructure. So if I want to buy a, I'm a fleet operator, I want a fleet of Toyota <laughs> hydrogen vehicles, when can I expect the infrastructure to be there? Yeah, like Philip mentioned, that's a pretty good statement. I think like two years, including the permission, everything uh, until go live. Uh, I think that's a good uh, assumption. It depends on the scale uh, and then technology. Uh, you need on board, uh, sorry, on site hydrogen or not. So it uh, depends on the option, but uh, uh, probably, yeah, two years is the range uh, from the start of the plan until the goal life. Okay. The rest of you think two years is reasonable? Yeah, from our perspective, we need to have hydrogen fueling stations up and running by the time that our trucks enter into st uh, start of, of production uh, out of our Coolidge manufacturing facility in Arizona. So we're targeting to have uh, fueling stations available for customer use by the end of 23. Um, certainly no, no later than that. All right, my, my last question as moderator. I, I read an article this week that says small modular nuclear reactors might be the best way to, to uh, uh, provide a carbon neutral way to generate hydrogen. Any thoughts on that? It's certainly one way in a extreme case. I, there's a, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's the best one at the type of scale we're talking about. And certainly from a regulatory perspective to be generating the megawatts of power you would need to be doing mass um, uh, electrolyzing. Uh, perhaps I'd be curious to know the, uh, the rationale there. Uh, we're pretty partial to PV projects. We've got a hundred megawatt uh, PV project going in on site at the, the platinum mine that we're working with um, that we helped them size to uh, generate all the hydrogen they'll need for their fleet of um, hundreds of these vehicles um, as well as provide power to the mine and I think you know when we look at ports when we look at 
uh, natural resources projects. They're a great place to start because they kind of can generate and consume their entire demand um, locally. So you don't have to you don't have to do a lot of the extremely hard work that Toyota and Nikola are doing, um, which is to build out that infrastructure for general use. Um, there are some areas you can start to to do that uh, just locally without access to the public. Um, hopefully that helps drive down costs. Again, you know these aren't going to be um, there's not hundreds of thousands of uh, ultra class mining vehicles. There's hundreds around the globe uh, in operation, uh, maybe thousands. Um, that's a very different type of refueling and infrastructure project uh, when you can keep it all local like that. But um, you know you'll see one technology trickle down to the other and, and vice versa, right? As, as Nikola and Toyota scale up production, uh, we're very excited for our fuel scale costs to drop as well. Uh, and for some of the other infrastructure, you know, we'll lean on everybody to provide. Um, that's, uh, that's great for everybody. With that, thank you very much. With that, our session is now concluded. I wanna thank the panelists and I'll toss it back to you. Thank, thank you. you all. Very Okay, thank you all very much for the presentation and discussion. I hope that the insight we gained from the panelists can be an inspiration for the development to the, to the projects of the uh, audience. Again, thank you so much, Mr. Masaki, Mr. Gerritsen, Mr. Arms, Mr. Adams for your presentation and Dr. Williams for the moderation. The next panel discussion is about hydrogen fueling stations. We have invited four panelists, Mr. Joseph Capello, CEO of Iwatani Corporation of America, Dr. Shane Stephens, founder and CDO, First Element Fuel, Mr. Michael Hirsch, general manager of Alameda Contra Posture Transit District, and Mr. Colin Armstrong, President and CEO, HPC. The panel moderator is Mr. Bill Elric, Executive Director of California Fuel Cell Partnership. Panelists will share information about efforts by businesses, industry groups, and governments in the Pacific West in Japan on lowering capital construction and operational costs of hydrogen fueling stations. This panel will explain some of the problems and practical solutions for supporting the exp expansion of these facilities. Mr. Elric, take it away. Thank you, Yamashita san. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's event. Uh, really quickly, the California Fuel Cell Partnership, for those who don't know, is a public private partnership created to establish and expand the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle market in California. For over two decades, we brought together diverse stakeholders uh, to establish the conditions for building the sustainable market, for building awareness and support for customers and decision makers, and working to be a trusted resource in hydrogen and fuel cell deployments. So today, California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia have developed various policies on zero emission vehicles and renewable and low carbon fuels and these are identical, many times identical, similar, or at the very least, uh, similar in their alignment. And all of us have climate allies around the globe, including Japan, that look to us as leaders and partners on hydrogen. And many see North American West Coast as an incredible investment opportunity. As we already know, Jap the Japanese investment in hydrogen along the North American West Coast is constantly increasing. And some of you might recall that earlier this year, NATO placed a full page ad in the LA Times talking about the hydrogen investment here. So it speaks a great deal to the activity and the potential that we all see. So similar to that, we also here at the partnership have seen numerous uh, Japanese companies become members, most of those at the higher levels of our membership. And I think it really recognizes the role California has played in this early market development. Early next year, the partnership's going to evolve. We're going to work and become a national nonprofit organization seeking to share our collective experience and capabilities to accelerate hydrogen and fuel cell mobility across North America. What we've recognized is that no one state or even country can decarbonize energy and transportation alone. 
and that it's only by working together that we can achieve these common environmental and economic objectives. So to that end, we look forward to formally engaging more stakeholders in this area. As we bring this great panel together, I have some initial thoughts on where we might take this journey and discussion today. I'll save most of those for the end, but I, I do wanna kick off that I think this conference might be the kickoff event that, that we're gonna see going forward for continued West Coast engagement. And I really wanna thank Jetro and NATO for hosting us today. So with that, I'd like to engage our great set of panelists. Each one is gonna spend just a few minutes introducing themselves and their company. And then we'll come back together and have, uh, ask questions and have a nice discussion. I want in the meantime to encourage the audience to submit questions in the question and answer section as we go. Our first speaker today is Joe Capello. He's the CEO of Iwatani Corporation of America. And for all transparency, I also want to introduce him. He is the incoming chair of our organization, the California Fuel Cell Partnership. So with that, Joe, I'd like to hand over the reins and, and have you introduce yourself and the company. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. And thank you to the Jetro and Neto uh, organizations for the invitation to participate today, um, along with this um, terrific uh, panel uh, of very experienced uh, folks. I have uh, just a couple of slides I'd like to use as maybe uh, an intro and to kick off some of the conversations. And so hopefully uh, you'll be able to see my slides. Bill, I'm gonna trust that you can tell me if you can't see them or not. We can see them, but if you can put them into presentation mode, I think we'll see them better. Okay. Perfect. All righty. So, um, if I may just uh, share that Iwatani Corporation is a company that will be celebrating its 93rd uh, birthday next May. Um, it has been a pioneer in the uh, development of hydrogen. It's the only truly vertically integrated hydrogen company in Japan with um, its own hydrogen production, liquid and gaseous, uh, along with uh, being one of the largest uh, fueling station developers uh, throughout the country. A number of years ago, uh, we decided to explore opportunities to expand and leverage the experience that we have in Japan outside of the country. And when we were looking at opportunities of where the fit might just be, California rose to the top of the list. A very uh, like-minded thinking and commitments for uh, decarbonization of transportation. Our initial foray into the California market uh, resulted in an, an acquisition of four liquid hydrogen stations in um, California, followed by uh, seven new stations that are currently under construction and soon to be commissioned in the, uh, in the coming months. We have um, uh, an additional 12 stations uh, coming online behind that, along with some upgrades uh, with the uh, support of the California uh, grant funding opportunities. We have a combination of liquid and gaseous supply options uh, and technologies for our, our uh, new stations. And we approach it from a total cost of ownership, of course, but in addition, it's about managing your carbon intensity lower each year, as well as um, the opportunity to have a portfolio of sources to enhance uh, reliability um, for, for maintaining uh, online performance. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, a couple of things that we considered uh, when looking at California uh, for investment um, that I, I'd like to share with you were really around what is the government's or the local area's commitment to decarbonization and where are they in their state of readiness? Um, we looked at what the government support mechanisms are, um, both from direct investment, um, de-risking of projects, um, funding opportunities, of course, and the regulatory environment. Um, is it friendly? Is it not friendly? Um, is it early? We also uh, wanted to ensure that we felt that there was a pipeline of 
products, cars, trucks, um, other equipment that would be transitioning from traditional um, uh, engines to fuel cells. And uh, what does that product pipeline look like? What's the timeline for it, of course? And are these products that customers want? The, um, the use case scenarios that were outlined earlier uh, by other presenters, I won't go through, but of course that plays an important role uh, for where the deployment of hydrogen fuel cell uh, equipment will be likely uh, stationed. And then finally, after all this investment, have we, have we created stakeholder value? Um, and that's um, never to be forgotten. Um, my final slide here is really about, as we explore uh, opportunities to expand beyond California, um, and the intention is to do that, uh, we look at what's the ready state of each of the, of the, uh, of the other states uh, being ready to, uh, to embark on this. And I think the California Fuel Cell Partnership is a, is a terrific opportunity and California is a terrific model to say what worked, uh, what can we leverage and what new things can we do. Um, the, the key point here, again, uh, I would say is the opportunity to de-risk investments. Lower risk is going to attract more capital. Um, and that's, that's fundamental to any uh, uh, opportunity, but in particular, for a, a very long range uh, uh, view on hydrogen. Also, there's a tremendous amount of federal opportunities coming our way uh, through the infrastructure package um, and a, a combination of state and regional grants or funding support that comes along with that, that not only will incentivize station deployment, but also um, up, uh, upstream investments into production. Um, the investment tax credit, production tax credit, other options, all could be leveraged to accelerate uh, the investments to build out these ecosystems that everyone's talking about. Um, something I'd, I'd like to also suggest is that the states um, and federal, to the extent it can, harmonize on certain items, um, certainly on, on programs such as LCFS, HRI programs, the carbon intensity and pathway approval process, uh, along with the credit programs. Um, that will streamline things. Um, I'll leave you with a couple of last uh, points. Uh, one, the, uh, of course we have to have hydrogen, we have to have it at an economically uh, viable cost. And, and of course we have to have technology at the stations that continuously are, is improving. So online performance continues to improve. All that are table stakes. But all of that um, can sit on the sidelines if the permitting process uh, and the entitlement process of all the different local municipalities doesn't, um, isn't on the same page. And that's an area that I would encourage um, as a roadblock, uh, raising hands and saying, this is an opportunity for substantial improvement. So finally, um, all of that said, um, bring the cars, bring the trucks, the infrastructure uh, is, is coming and well on its way. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to give some introductory comments. That was great, thank you, Joe. Next up, I'd like to invite Dr. Shane Stevens, who's founder and chief development officer at First Element Fuel. Shane? Thanks, Bill. And um, thank you to the folks at uh, Tetro for the invitation to, uh, to be on this panel. Um, so First Element Fuel was started as a um, company in California focused on developing a network of hydrogen refueling stations so that the fuel cell cars uh, could be marketed in the state. Um, I was one of the founders with my two other partners. And um, uh, we've had you know, quite a bit of success at uh, establishing that initial network of fueling stations. Um, today, we're um, the largest retailer of hydrogen in the world. Um, out of our 32 hydrogen stations that we operate in California, uh, we're doing uh, around 1,200 fills uh, per day um, and uh, about 3,500 kilograms uh, on a daily basis. This year so far, we've performed 327,000 fills and we've sold uh, over 780,000 kilograms of hydrogen into fuel cell vehicles. And um, we've also done 
uh, all of those hydrogen sales with hydrogen that is zero carbon intensity uh, certified with the, uh, uh, with the Air Resources Board. Uh, so we're also doing a really effective job at decarbonizing the transportation fuel uh, through all of the, the fills that we're doing. Um, we're also the first company in the world to deploy hydrogen stations that have four fueling positions um, and have deployed the highest capacity hydrogen refueling stations um, commercially anywhere in the world. Um, and that's been kind of a big part of our goal in recent years is to figure out how to scale up hydrogen and achieve the business case. Uh, to do that, we are um, pursuing quite aggressively the model of liquid hydrogen um, production and distribution with cryo pumping to convert the liquid hydrogen into uh, cold pressurized gas for refueling into the vehicle. Um, from the technology that's out there today, um, this seems like the best way to achieve uh, scale and cost reduction uh, for us today. And uh, through deployment of this model, we've actually been able to drive uh, the price of hydrogen fuel at our stations down significantly. The average uh, price of hydrogen in California today is somewhere around $16 and 50 cents uh, per kilogram. And we've been able to drive the cost down by about 25% already uh, with the introduction of our larger liquid higher capacity stations. Uh, to uh, an average of about $13 uh, per kilogram at the pump today. And we see a road to achieve you know, $10 per kilogram or below that through the deployment of, of this model of supply chain and uh, cryo pump hydrogen station. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff that we're pursuing in California. And um, it's not without its challenges. We're still very much in the early stages of hydrogen and learning a lot. Uh, and I look forward to getting into that uh, a bit more today. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Shane. Next up, we have Michael Hirsch. He's with the he's the general manager of the Alameda Costa Contra Costa Transit District, or AC Transit, as we often say. Uh, Michael, slow on the mute button today. Thanks, Bill. Um, we do say AC Transit because Alameda Contra Costa can be a mouthful at times. Uh, I just have very few slides that I'm going to share, really to kind of orient you to who we are. Uh, in the earlier session. I love the question somebody asked, is California the leader? Well, when it comes to public transit and zero emission, we absolutely are. Uh, I, thanks to the, uh, to the host for putting this on, you know, when we talk about market opportunity in California, for those of you that are not aware, for public transit, 100% of our buses have to be zero emission by 24 by Air Resources Board regulation. That's over 10,000 buses that need to be replaced in California, speaking just for AC Transit, we're the third largest agency, uh, transit agency by ridership in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we're the largest bus only agency in the United States, over 640 buses that just my agency alone has to transition to zero emission. We currently operate the largest fleet of hydrogen fuel cell buses and we have battery electric buses. I'll talk very briefly today about how we're doing a side-by-side -side comparison. But if you look at the slide, you see a map of the San Francisco Bay Area. Alameda and Contra Costa counties are on the right side of that, of that uh, water mass. D3, that stands for division three, no hydrogen or, or battery there. D2, the orange dot is our first hydrogen station and, and it's actually shared. We can fuel our buses in our yard, but then we have a civilian or automobile uh, pump on the outside of the division. Geo is our headquarters. Division four is in the heart of Oakland called our seminary division, both hydrogen and battery electric there. CMF is Central Maintenance Facility where we do heavy repair. Division six is in Hayward, California. Collectively, again, 640 buses that have to be replaced. Um, we have been doing this since early 2000, 2003. We, we started slow with our first hydrogen fuel cell bus. In 2006, we added the uh, Van Hools. 2010, and this slide's actually a little bit outdated. I, I'll talk in a minute about the, the new flyer buses that we just put into service. But the Van Hools uh, design life, we were, we were looking for five to 10,000 hours. We've gone over 25,000 hours on the fuel cell. We've had great success with uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses. I present this to you today to know that as a general manager, chief executive officer, I have to give my board the facts, uh, the information so they can make a decision whether should we buy battery electric buses? or should we be hydrogen, buy hydrogen buses? I am here to tell you that hydrogen is ready today. 
with the exec exception of one problem. And it was just mentioned by Dr. Stevens, it's the cost of fuel. He talked about getting it down to, to sub 10. We need $5 a diesel gallon equivalent for hydrogen fuel cell buses to be competitive against battery electric buses. We are currently paying about seven thirty-five per diesel gallon equivalent or per kilo, if you will, of, of hydrogen. Uh, we are reforming some of that hydrogen, a small amount on, on site, but we're purchasing the most of it. Uh, our price is actually going up to $9 a kilo, so we're going the wrong direction. I wanted to, again, mention the new flyer buses we just added. Uh, 43 buses coming. Right now we have five battery electric buses from New Flyer, 10 fuel cell buses from New Flyer. The important thing here is 2019 models, same model year bus, battery compared to fuel cell, same day, same operating temperature, same route. So we're getting what we call a five by five study, a data peer reviewed by Stanford University available on our way website, actransit.org slash Zeb, but we're giving the industry the absolute comparison of where is hydrogen in, in the realm of competitiveness compared to battery electric. I think we were all surprised by the Texas uh, electrical grid problems, not so much in California, at least in Northern California with PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric. We already know that the uh, battery or the, the, the electrical infrastructure has its weaknesses. Understand from an operations perspective, I'm used to fueling a bus with diesel fuel in about eight to 10 minutes, a 300 mile range. I can do the exact same thing with hydrogen, eight to 10 minute fueling cycle, 300 mile, about 280 mile range. That obviously can be adjusted by battery and tank size. Battery buses, one, I need basically a charger for nearly every bus in yard, 200, 225 buses. Some buses charge for an hour, some buses need to charge for six hours. So logistically, from an operations perspective, much more complicated. But the battery, battery industry is winning because you don't need a huge upfront capital cost for fueling station. <clears throat> However, when you put in a hydrogen fueling station, you immediately have that scalability. That's why we can go up to over 40 hydrogen fuel cell buses in the near future. Um, we're still not fully decided. Um, we, we have very much concerns in the earlier presentation. They talked about the difficulty on bringing the, the scalable electrical distribution to the, to, the, uh, to the state, if you will, to my operating divisions versus we have the fueling capability. We have the fueling time the cost of hydrogen is killing us. I was so thrilled to be invited to speak here because I'm trying to get that word out. This is like a 24 month problem, folks. If the cost of hydrogen does not, kind of, does not come down, understand that we have to operate a bus for 12 years. So our timeline to make those purchase decisions to make 2040 is right here. And if hydrogen is gonna be $9 a, a kilogram, we cannot, we just simply cannot afford it. The technology is there, the reliability is there, the range is there, the fueling time is there. Not so on a battery bus. The range on a battery bus on a cold day, the range on a battery bus in Michigan compared to a battery bus in San Diego are greatly different. Not so with hydrogen. Um, I try not to be an evangelist. I try to give my board the facts and let them make the decision. But the reality is hydrogen is losing the battle if the cost of fuel doesn't come down. That's the obstacle for us. It's not technical. It's not capital cost. It's an operating cost. Thanks so much, folks, for letting me be here. Uh, passionate and excited about this. Love the earlier session. I hope ours is as uh, entertaining and informational for everybody. I'll stop my screen and turn it back to you, Bill. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for sharing that experience. Now, finally, uh, we have Colin Armstrong. He's the president and CEO of HTech uh, on our northern of all of our guests today. Uh, Colin, tell us more about HTech and what you're up to. Yeah, sure. And I'm going to uh, share a slide, just uh, just one slide. <laughs> so it uh, keep it short. So um, Hopefully that's uh, full screen to everybody. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks, Bill, and and all the organizers. It's great to uh, it's great to see the coordination. So I I wear a couple hats, and I go back quite a way. Um, so I was uh, I was around during what we call the hydrogen highway days, where we really started the conversation with California and, and Washington and Oregon to to explore what was going on. And I, I think 
those days proved what was needed to to really move the technology and the safety um, aspects where it is today and the operational like we just heard um, so uh, the the hat I wear as uh, HTech I'll, I'll talk about in a sec but I also wear the hat of um, the chair of hydrogen BC which is a group put together uh, on behalf of the government and industry to really try and coordinate a lot of the activities such as Bill and uh, the California Hydrogen Fuel Cell Partnership have done. So we've, uh, we've looked to the south and learned um, that there is a lot of coordination needed and a lot of um, information flow and a lot of uh, planning and thinking going on. So, so at Hydrogen BC, we've got a variety of members that um, are probably close to 20 now and uh, working through all the opportunities, um, the plans, the uh, support needed from the government. And uh, so from HTEC's perspective, we are very similar to First Element with more of a focus on Canadian provinces, um, activities in British Columbia, as you can see here, uh, activities in oh, six other provinces or five other provinces. So we're getting a bit of a perspective and actually we're active in California as well with a station down there and looking to Washington, Oregon. So we really got a pretty good flavor of the different approaches and opportunities and challenges in these uh, in these different regions. And they are they're similar but different. So um, that's an important uh, aspect, I think, for us to talk about today is, yeah, how do you streamline? And uh, the gentleman, uh, sorry, from Irritani, um, uh, Joseph talked about it uh, as well, that it, it can be a stumbling block and it can really slow down and challenge those uh, investment decisions that are made. So, so just real quick, this is a map of British Columbia area, Greater Vancouver, Lower Mainland, we call it. Um, you can see the stations that we have. These are uh, blue ones are open. The other three are under construction that uh, one of them were helping the University of British Columbia have their own station. Uh, there's probably about another 10 to 12 in earlier stage development. Uh, we're about to announce a couple heavy duty stations that, that we're doing and uh, really trying to build the ecosystem along with the hydrogen supply um, that, uh, that is needed in, in the region. So uh, I'll leave it at that and, and super interested to um, discuss and, and provide in, insights to, I, I think, attract the, again, the planning, the interest, the, the, the thought leadership that's needed to move this forward and, and take advantage of the opportunities that hydrogen provide for zero emission transportation, as well as obviously the carbon management and enabling of uh, low carbon energy sources and renewables. So back to you, Bill. Great, that's great, Colin. And, and, and I want to uh, first encourage everyone um, in the audience, send questions in in the Q&A box and, and we'll help field those next. But, but I took some notes when you were all uh, uh, giving and sharing kind of in your experience and progress so far. And, and I think my first question, I, I had it in mind, but really want to point a few things you all said. And, and some key words here were, how do we de-risk this environment? Um, how do we reach a scale uh, with our investments so that we can start seeing the cost reductions necessary to bring this into a reality and really get at those costs of fuel, equipment, et cetera, and, and make this uh, a business. And then finally, the collaboration needed, and Colin uh, highlighted that as well. And so my question with those in mind, and really looking forward towards a West Coast corridor, a national, even an international market, I, I'd like to ask each of you what actions or mechanisms were the most influential to your success today? These could be maybe early market policies or incentives, stakeholder collaboration. But as we look into larger collaboration efforts in areas that haven't touched this before, what would you share uh, around what got it started and what we need to keep doing in order to make this grow more? 
I can jump in and we can maybe work backwards <laughs> through, great. The, uh, through the uh, the group here. So, and, and I think the answer is going to be very similar. Um, you need, uh, or we've all had success from the low carbon fuel standards or regulations that uh, have uh, helped support the, the operations and build of the infrastructure. I think that would be good to expand. Um, and there's a lot of great discussions going on in that area. Uh, obviously, the mandates to drive vehicles uh, adoption and supply to the to the market, and uh, and then of course the government uh, support needed, um, depending on where the market is, right, to drive down costs. As you get more and more, you see in California, you need less direct government incentives to drive it. So I think you'd build on those three uh, three areas that we've had success in, and uh, in British Columbia as well, obviously in California. So with the notion of work, sorry, Bill, you want me to go ahead? Please. With the notion of working uh, from the last to the to the first year, first off, I would say that hydrogen, in the, we knew that the zero emission mandate was coming. Uh, it's been under discussion with the Air Resources Board for many years. Early on, we recognized that the, the range with battery was just not there, so hydrogen got an early start. Um, I think because of the failure to get the, the market growth, there was a a lot of startups that just didn't have the resources to bring the reliability and quite frankly the cost of the vehicle was very prohibitive now that we have the big suppliers in with the with the big reliability um, the cost of the vehicle has come down the fueling stations are, are comparable to cmg so again as i said earlier the capital isn't there what we're still fighting with is you we start with a demonstration you can roll out a charger and two or three battery buses and cut the ribbon and have the celebration you don't get those demand charges. You don't see the weaknesses in the in the high temperature days or the low temperature days, days on the range. I think, again, I'm speaking public transit. I don't think the general public knows that a transit bus operates 18 to 20 hours a day. We'll change operators um, quite often on the route. The operators do what's called a field relief, but that bus stays out there. Uh, comes in on fumes for diesel buses. Um, it's, it's unfortunate for me that we're, I feel like we're on the two yard line. We're about to drive this thing home. I, I wish the industry would, I think for it, at least in California, the Toyota has been very successful because of the subsidized fuel. I would like to see the manufacturers get together, the vehicle manufacturers get together and maybe even the station suppliers, subsidized fuel, a few years of subsidized fuel, a, a few years on a vehicle, not the 12 years of a transit vehicle. Get that fuel cost down, even if it's artificially, even if, even if it breaks into profits a little bit, so that we do get that market penetration. We can show what the what the honest operating cost is, and and then I think we have an honest race to to convert to but to make the twenty forty deadline. Um, so policy has definitely been um, the uh, big driving factor in California um, between the zero emission vehicle policy and um, the funding mechanism from the California Energy Commission and then the low carbon fuel standard uh, regulation from ARB. Those have been the three big driving factors, I think, to successfully establish a network of hydrogen stations. Um, and I think the other key thing that it's done is it started to finally create some market certainty. And, uh, and I think that's that's unlocked private investment. And now there seems to be plenty of private investment to going in. But I think more importantly, the thing that market certainty creates is the big challenge that is uh, affecting us right now in hydrogen, which is the supply chains, the supply chains for both the equipment uh, for hydrogen refueling stations um, and equipment for production and distribution of the fuel, and then the supply chains for the fuel itself. And I think that's going to get um, to Michael's uh, issue of driving the cost down. Uh, today, for example, you know, I can't go out and buy fueling station equipment that is actually commercially viable and works. Uh, I'm basically beta testing equipment on customers, right, which is not a real market scenario. It's also too expensive and I can't get it as fast as I want it. Um, so if you have market certainty, I, I think, and we're working very closely with suppliers as well, but I hope that the right amount of effort goes into equipment development, equipment testing, equipment availability, um, so that, you know, we can deploy this market fast enough, achieve scale, and then through all that, achieve uh, cost reduction that's needed in order to be more competitive. So, um, so I think the policy has set the stage. The policy is really critical. And uh, now um, I think we're in a position for private industry to respond 
And, um, you know, unfortunately, the I think the vehicle manufacturers are a little bit ahead of us on the infrastructure side um, and having to, to work through some of that pain where their customers are, you know, not experiencing a fully commercial system uh, that's, that's ready uh, for the commercial market. And we're having to do uh, some beta testing on customers. But I think we're turning the corner here pretty fast and uh, going to be offering a very uh, competitive and compelling solution on the infrastructure side uh, over the next couple of years. So we're, we're getting there. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll echo uh, what Shane said, of course, um, and maybe add to it. On the de-risking side, um, I think we're trying to approach it in a couple different ways. Uh, one, um, trying to control the things that we can control. And by that, I mean adding new ways of bringing hydrogen into the market. So becoming more uh, vertically integrated. So we need to have a portfolio of sources of hydrogen. So we'll be um, buying from all the traditional uh, areas. But in addition, we want to create uh, incentive for uh, new investment to go into new uh, hydrogen uh, production. Um, full-on green hydrogen production and more capacity coming into the market of a diverse, diverse nature will add um, resiliency. It'll, it'll um, take us away from the volatility of natural gas prices and costs that uh, tend to uh, influence the cost of hydrogen um, and, and move towards um, less in hydrocarbon-based uh, hydrogen production. And I think that will also uh, result in lower cost and more uh, reliable sources of hydrogen. We're investing in uh, transportation technology, uh, transportation equipment like other companies to be able to ensure that we can um, never run out uh, and go to an abundancy of different uh, locations. So, you know, we've had challenges of staying online, um, but we are taking steps like other companies are to um, take control of our destiny. I said another area of de-risking is really around to achieve scale. A lot of capital is required, and capital uh, is uh, the cost of that capital is a function of how much risk. And so, to build a very large-scale uh, hydrogen production facility, or even building hydrogen stations without the certainty of demand, um, increases your cost of capital. And to the extent that we can create mechanisms to create some type of a floor, like the HRI program has done for building stations larger, we had a mechanism similar to that with production so we could um, build capacity in excess of what we would be able to demonstrate as um, committed demand. That could uh, result in building this capacity and um, taking some risk uh, out of the equation. Uh, and allow for uh, for uh, more production to come online. So just a couple of areas to, to think about. I'm curious if I can ask a very short, I'll, I'll ask this for a very short answer because I think you all touched upon it, but if you could pick one policy and it may not be the, po one policy or one item, what would you enact in a couple words or less that would change this market for you? Policy bill. Um, so, if we want to go first to last, um, sure. policy um, uh, working with the municipalities on uh, streamlining entitlement and permitting. I love all policies equally. I don't have a choice. You don't have a favorite? <laughs> I don't have a favorite. I am keying on the policy question on purpose, though, because I think that starts the the confidence mechanism or the confidence state that you're all talking about. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I will say um, direct grant funding and subsidies uh, continue to be critical, but I think that they uh, are, are playing a smaller role compared to private investment, right? And so I think um, hopefully that's more of a transitionary policy, right, where you're, you're providing direct grant subsidies to stations. And I think the, the, the more key longer term policies for, for creating um, market stability are the ZEV policy and the LCFS capacity credit policy, right? So I think those will play uh, a bigger role uh, over the next decade. And the direct grant funding, while still remains critical, I think you're already seeing that it's playing a smaller role compared to private investment and it will continue to play 
you know, a, a shrinking role um, over, over, over the next 10 years. So I'm going to take an off ramp here. Um, the cost of hydrogen, the hydrogen availability is largely market driven, uh, whereas the price of electricity is regulated. So I would ask for a transit electricity rate that I can lock in, no demand charges. I know whether I charge at one o'clock in the afternoon or one o'clock in the morning, what I'm going to pay for kilowatt of electricity. Again, because it's regulated, that's the magic policy that I would like like to have. I, I, I would prefer to get the cost of hydrogen down so that I don't have to worry about range and charging time and all that. But given where I'm at today, if I had a magic request, it would be lock in the price of electricity because it is regulated. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, one, one ring to rule them all, uh, Bill, I think <laughs> I would, I, I guess I would try and say that, that, you know, that, that it's recognized that this has to happen. And from there, um, a lot of stuff falls out. And right now we're still arguing as to what are we actually trying to make happen here in, in the sense. So if you were to just maybe carve up a portion of the market, and like, like you guys have done, Bill, you've put a vision out and, uh, I think that's hugely important to actually wrap into policy like they do in the ZEB, but there's so many opportunities mixed into this. We just got to decide to make it happen to a certain degree. And then I think a lot of stuff will fall out. We'll be able to get um, AC Transit on board and we'll be able to get that investment if we send the signal that this has to be part of the solution, which I think California is doing a pretty good job of, but uh, if you want one policy, <laughs> make it simple. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and thank you for all joining me on that little uh, uh, effort. I think in order to get that confidence and to get that investment, that private investment, as, as Shane mentioned, it's, it's having a little bit of that de-risking and, and wondering if there were any magic bullets or, or what if we were to put together our, our collective heads across the West Coast what we would want to sit down and, and harmonize and create together to get there. So I just wanted to pull those ideas out as we go forward. Um, we have some questions in the, in the uh, chat here about locations. And I'm going to say there's, I forget the different ones I saw, but when's the station coming in Reading or my hometown? If anyone wants to get specific, great. But maybe another way I'd like to, to change that is when you look at building out the infrastructure, because you only build so many stations at a time, but you have a long-term plan, how do you select the locations you are selecting in a general sense? What makes those choices that you chose A, B, and C instead of X, Y, Z in station locations? And I'll start at the top and go down this time again. So Joe? Sure, Bill. Um, well, you know, we try to build um, in, in a couple of ways. So how do we uh, go with our site selection? Well, we try to really understand the market, where the car is going to be deployed and, and the various reports that CARB issues and relationships with the various OEMs to try to hone in on where the cars are going to go. So nothing real smart about that, but that's, that's one area. Um, the fact that the, the HRI programs uh, do have some constraints about where you can uh, locate, that has an influencing factor uh, as well. And then of course, um, it really comes down to the availability and the fit of the equipment that you can put into a, uh, into a community and the readiness and um, interest of a community to, to welcome in a station. So um, I'm sure there's lots of other um, important areas and chain will cover those. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say anything too different from, from Joe, actually. I mean, it's, uh, uh, number one, we try to go to higher density vehicle populations, right? Because if you want to, if you're going to build a station, you want to maximize the amount of usage that it's going to get into early, in early years. And I think beyond uh, vehicle density, you have to look at markets that, um, see more new vehicle sales rather than used vehicle sales, right? Because these vehicles are new ones that are going into the market. And I think if you look at historic sales, you know, using something like hybrids uh, or battery vehicles as a marker, you can kind of get a sense for, well, you know, they tend to adopt uh, more clean vehicles or more new technology vehicles in these markets, right? So that's another factor that we use. Um, I think, you know, this is probably an opportunity to say, though, that um, it's really important to think about 
uh, places where people drive rather than just places where people live, right? Because I think it's it's easier to make a case for putting a station where people live. But if you only do that, you're no better than a battery electric vehicle, right? Because then people are tethered to a station. If you want to show the full utility of a fuel cell car, you have to give the people the ability to buy their car in San Diego and go skiing in Lake Tahoe that same day, right? Um, First Element built a few of, you know, what we call these connector and destination stations, but economically they're tough. Um, so I think it shouldn't be, it's, a, it's a, maybe a smaller but very critical piece to, to consider how do we incentivize and make sure that those stations get built so that, you know, it's an attractive consumer experience uh, that people are used to, you know, they can drive people like, drive places like Las Vegas, which you can't do from LA today, right? Or drive places like uh, Oregon, which you can't do from San Francisco today. Um, so I think uh, uh, that's, that's a critical piece that when choosing locations, we have to kind of make sure that those stations get supported somehow and get built. And uh, I'll be frank, in California, there's not a lot of incentive for those kind of stations to get built today. So, so on the surface, it's a really easy question for me. We just put them where our buses are in the, in the bus yards. But I will tell you, the other side of the equation for us is the, is the capital to replace the fleet. We developed what's called our clean corridors plan, a board adopted plan that says we deploy as we bring on zero emission buses, we deploy them in the communities that have the worst air quality, non-attainment zones, uh, disadvantaged communities. That has resonated with the state of California and getting us some fairly large grants enough to buy almost 50 zero emission buses because of that commitment to, to deploy in clean corridors. Uh, the other equation that we're looking at and was talked about in the earlier session is what is it really going to cost to bring the electricity if we go the battery route uh, which division has the most substation capacity near it uh, what's the cost to increase the substation capacity if we have to we're not there yet um, but certainly for the deployment of the zero emission buses it's it's uh, community air quality disadvantaged community related and therefore uh, where those lines are is where the fuel stations will be built first. We already have two, so we only have two to go. Yeah, I think, Bill, there's the sort of the macro and the micro to that answer. Um, I mean, we, uh, looking in British Columbia, we we want to look at the, the network. And as, as um, Shane talked about, you do want to have these destination stations. So that's sort of a little bit more in the macro level. And then when it comes down to it, yeah, space, space is a premium. And um, you also have to convince the host. Uh, the host has an objective um, to maximize profits from that site and uh, and their investment there. So for one, you gotta convince them to get on it. And it's quite a fragmented universe, the, the ownership and operations of uh, fueling stations. I certainly don't see it going to, we, we've tried and we're in the middle of some uh, stations that are not at fueling stations and the permitting there is even more of a nightmare to, to deal with. So that's that's not a fast route to market. So uh, public fueling stations, car locks, behind the fence, like at the transit is, uh, is really the locations. Hey, Bill, um, this is Joe, if I can add um, just a, maybe a follow on comment. So thinking about how we are going to work to connect where we are in California all the way up to where, where Colin is, um, you know, the thoughts that we've been, you know, really um, exploring are taking the ecosystem approach, right? Having the, uh, all the essentials in place where you've got the ability to have uh, supply, uh, the transportation equipment, um, the steady, the, the, the density of stations um, in an area that you can economically service, um, both from an O&M perspective of the equipment, um, but, but also to uh, ensure that your fueling uh, is, is, uh, is quite efficient. And then look to uh, the OEMs, whether it's the heavy duty uh, companies uh, or the light duty uh, automobile companies, and really try to go in and, and plant ecosystems all the way up the corridor as you get to um, Vancouver and then uh, eastward. So I think, you know, that is something to think about in terms of how to um, deploy more stations as well as um, how to get um, the, the, the two regions connected. 
if I were to lean in, and we might have lost Shane, um, we'll see if he's there in the in the background. But leaning into that a little bit more, if I may, um, what it sounds like is, and and knowing you all pretty well, uh, we have the pieces, we have the experience, uh, we've done it before, and we've done it very different ways in different parts, and and learned, and, and I think collectively are all better off for it. But if I look at what we did here in California, it was briefly described, it was a consumer-based model, meaning everyday people like you and, and me, um, getting them into these cars and having a model of clusters with connectors and destinations. And that model worked for that audience. We've got experience in fleets from, from transit fleets, which can be great anchors, um, to other fleets that we've seen through other alternative fuels because of the, the return to base approach. So we've got a second strategy that could work as well. If I layer on that, the uh, hydrogen hub concepts that are starting to be developed, which wrap in, uh, as was just mentioned, everything from production and distribution to those demand centers, it seems like we have the good elements that between what's already happening up in the Vancouver area and in California, the experience and the local opportunities in across all I'll say all four regions, including Oregon and Washington, it seems we have the right experience and capabilities. I'm curious as we look at that, if we were to place those together, would you say that's a good starting point for our strategy to create a Western corridor? Would you see any egregious issues to how we might need to reconsider that or really excited about something like that? Uh, yeah, I can jump in from here. I, I absolutely believe we do. Yeah, and, and I think the policy is starting to form the players, the supply chain, not like Shane's brought them. There, there's still supply chain issues in lots of areas, but we need to uh, create that demand to solve those supply chain issues. And, uh, and it's coming. I am more of a proponent of the light duty to, to pave the way than perhaps a lot of people are. And uh, Bill, I love your input on that for the crowd that uh, I think it's paramount that, that it gets uh, promoted. It, it drives so many aspects of what we need to do. As we talked about, trans and, and uh, heavy duty in the previous are, are a lot less and, and the vehicles aren't actually available today. So that's that's my take on it. And I'd be curious after the comments for you to add to that. I'm not sure I can add a whole lot. Certainly, you know, we're proud of our, our uh, dual use station in Emeryville. Um, not a whole lot of, I think, 12,000 kilos last year. Obviously, with COVID and the lack of availability for vehicles, it's not a huge number. Um, I, When you say West Coast, I would just really try to include Las Vegas, Reno. You know, Tahoe was already mentioned. I just, I, you look at the, what Tesla's doing with the superchargers, and I think it's a similar concept, but we're doing it almost as a you know, a club, you got to join the club to to uh, build a network out, whereas you have basically one manufacturer building out this charger network. So I think you're on to something. I, I definitely think there's opportunity. I think we just need to be very, very careful. No disrespect to my friends in Reading, but I'm not sure which has more market um, availability right now. You know, Reno, Reading, Las Vegas, we just need to make careful decisions. Yep. Um, you know, I, honestly, I think as we um, look at um, the uh, opportunities we talked about, uh, I think Colin mentioned the light duty side, you know, uh, we're, we're obviously committed to the light duty side. You look at the uh, transportation hubs and you look at the, the value of goods that are transported, you know, from Vancouver to Tijuana and, and eastward, um, to, to Las Vegas and onward on to Phoenix. Um, we really think that um, heavy duty is going to really play an important role in um, the uh, expansion and, and really the proliferation of, um, of more capacity that's gonna come on. The demand profile of some of these stations are, are significantly more than what the light duty stations are. And, and while the customer ex experience is entirely different um, um, and, and in some cases, mutually exclusive, uh, other than the very large truck stops. I think there's there's going to be a need for both, and I'm 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 um, I'm encouraged by what we're seeing in terms of the interest by the various states to um, have a parallel path for multiple modes 
whether it's light duty, medium duty, uh, heavy duty, even uh, marine, and, and now we're even looking at um, um, uh, airplanes. So I think it's, it's gonna take a multitude of uh, demand um, uh, creation to, to really you know, launch this and, and not just one. Yeah, and I, I wanna say that uh, I'm gonna keep going here and I see we're about to wrap up. Um, I think AC Transit's been a center of excellence and a model and to me, the fleet opportunity that can go anywhere. And, and that as a, a hub or as a base load, I think will create the kind of scale uh, we need and it's very manageable, it's very doable. We have the experience in AC Transit and others uh, around the country have been doing that. I think back to Colin, your question on the light duty, I'm absolutely with you because as much as we will see even more battery cars coming to the market, in California, the light duty hydrogen fuel cell market's the only ZEV market in the world that's shown a path to sustainability, meaning a real market supply and demand. It can be achieved by the end of the decade if we keep doing what we're doing. And what's important to that is that's gonna drive those costs down, not just for that light duty market, but for those transit fleets, the truck fleets and every other application we might find. So to me, light duty market in California very specifically is that down payment or that sphere point to enable the rest of the hydrogen economy. I, I want to volunteer the partnership and I'm looking at my incoming chair, uh, uh, Mr. Capello, to say that we would volunteer to host a symposium early next year with this audience and, and the others that were in the other panels, because these are the folks that need to come together, um, start talking through these issues. I specifically asked you some questions about what were the, if you had to single it down to a few things, what do we bring to that agenda topic uh, with all of these policies and industry leaders, or I'm sorry, government and industry leaders um, to make this happen. So I'll volunteer unless I, I get a kick in the shin virtually from, from Joe, We'd love to host that and start creating a sustainable Pacific coast from BC, British Columbia, all the way down to, to Baja, California, and everywhere in between. Um, I think we're right on time. I was going to ask another question, and, and I just will apologize for being over and, and thank all the panel for all the discussion. Uh, really enjoyed it, and I think we just got started, so I'm looking forward to next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That wraps up our panel discussion on hydrogen fueling stations. Many thanks to Mr. Capello, Dr. Stephens, Mr. Hirsch, Mr. Armstrong, and our moderator, Mr. Elwick. Now, we will move on to the final panel of this program on addressing the challenges of and prospects for deploying fuel cells and hydrogen power generation to enhance electrical grid reliability. We will include a 20 minute discussion and audience Q&A time. The panelists are Mr. Dexter Gauntlet, Head of Smart City Utility Advisor, Panasonic North America. Mr. Peter Sowicki, Regional Director of Sales and Marketing at Mitsubishi Power Americas and Mr. Martin Adams, General Manager and Chief Engineer at Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. The panel moderator is Ms. Janice Lin, Founder and President at Green Hydrogen Coalition. Ms. Lin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tak, for that introduction and for your leadership and Japan's leadership to accelerate a clean global hydrogen economy for all of us. It's an honor to be invited to moderate this final panel, challenges and prospects for deploying fuel cells and hydrogen power generation for grid reliability. I'm particularly excited about this panel as the need for grid reliability was my personal entry point for becoming so passionate about green hydrogen. And it all started with a simple question when I was serving as executive director of the California Energy Storage Alliance. And that simple question was, what duration, what kind of energy storage will we need to fully take advantage of low cost renewable energy? I learned that hydrogen was an excellent energy storage carrier 
that could today provide very long duration, even seasonal storage. And I learned that the power sector is also an excellent near-term candidate to help, as other panelists have been chatting in the prior panels, de-risk the supply chain and scale production, driving down cost, not only for the power sector, but also to help accelerate and enable many other sectors. So for this panel, we'll be exploring the use of hydrogen in the power sector and its important role in achieving mass scale, low delivered cost green hydrogen, which we heard on our other panels is key to accelerating progress for transportation and other sectors. Joining me today are the following esteemed experts, uh, as talk listed, we have Peter Sawicki from Mitsubishi. He'll be addressing the global power sector need and the timing for this need. Dexter Gauntlet, who's the head of Panasonic's North America Smart City Utility Advisory, will touch on what Panasonic's doing in the US and how clean and green hydrogen is key for utility IRP planning nationwide. Then we'll hear from Marty Adams, who's the Chief Engineer and General Manager of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, North America's largest municipal utility. He'll share his perspective on the role of green hydrogen from a utility and off-taker perspective. And then I'll close out the panel with some thoughts on our recent work at the Green Hydrogen Coalition to advance and architect North America's first green hydrogen hub at scale, High Deal Los Angeles Southwest. I'd like to uh, request that our speakers limit their remarks to under five minutes. We have a shortened panel here. Uh, that way, we'll for sure have time for some audience questions. Without further ado, Peter, the floor is yours. And we'll go from Peter to Dexter and then Marty. Thank you, Janice. And thank you to Nito and to JetRo for putting this on. Go ahead and present my screen. Please let me know, Janice, if that looks OK to you. It looks fabulous. Thank you. So once again, I'm Peter Sawicki. I'm the Regional Sales Director for Mitsubishi Power. I'm based in San Diego, responsible for West Coast sales and marketing. So the last few years of my life have been living and breathing uh, hydrogen as 98% um, of our business in the United States is, is really gas turbine specific. So as we're looking to move to the next stage of decarbonization, we're really focusing on our gas turbines and other technologies. So I'll go through quickly a few slides here, just quick advertisement about Mitsubishi Power and what we're up to, and then why we're so excited about hydrogen and where hydrogen is going in the United States. So we'll start out with the hydrogen ready gas turbines. So one of the things we, we need to know about gas turbines is that all of the OEMs, Mitsubishi in particular, has a wealth of experience on uh, operation of hydrogen in the gas turbine fleet. So we have several million hours of hydrogen experience at some form of blend up to the 80% blend in our existing gas turbine fleet. What we're really looking to do here is, is implement new technology into our advanced class fleet and utilize uh, hydrogen production and hydrogen utilization in that fleet. And in doing so, maintain the NOx emissions that we see with modern natural gas plants today. And so what we're planning to do here is to have our entire fleet 100% hydrogen capable by 2030 timeframe. So we're well on that. We're in the, well into the R&D stages in our new combustion technology. And so we're very confident that we're moving very forward, very quickly into that program. And as Mr. Adams will discuss in a few, we we're very excited about the, the project in, in, in Delta, Utah specifically. But I won't steal Marty's thunder and I'll let him talk about that project in detail. But we're also doing things like investing in PV solar development companies. We have a company called Ordin in Pittsburgh where they're focusing on nothing but uh, development of PV solar projects. And it's really just an enhancement of our business and helping us to understand the market better and helping us decarbonize. We have a joint venture with Vestas in the offshore wind business at our parent company level. And so that market is growing exponentially as well. Uh, we have a, a lithium ion battery group within the Mitsubishi Power Americas team, which is also growing significantly. We recently commissioned a, our first unit in Southern California, first large scale unit, I'll say. And we've got several other units that we've announced uh, for commercial operations shortly. And uh, that business is also growing exponentially. So for the short duration storage market, we are excited about batteries. So this will not be a, you know, a, a, a selection of technology or a preference of technology. We do believe that uh, there are technologies for each use case. We believe long duration storage is the right use case for, for green hydrogen. And then more recently, we've gotten into projects like energy hydrogen energy storage projects. So this project, this is a photo of our our Delta Utah site where we're working on a project called the Advanced Clean Energy Storage with a project with our partner Magnum Development. And when, when we commission this project, we'll be commissioning two salt caverns. Each cavern will have the 
capability of about 150 gigawatt hours of, of hydrogen energy storage. And that site has the potential for up to 100 of these caverns. So we really look at that site in Delta, Utah to be almost an endless hydrogen uh, storage uh, potential and really looking into how we interconnect that in, into the grid as we go forward. As we heard from some of the panelists in the, in the prior sessions, that um, the hub and spoke approach seems to be a preferred approach among many, uh, many companies. And we like the idea of cross-sector coupling, which is uh, we're focused, of course, in the power side. And we believe that we can scale very quickly on the power side because a gas turbine, a 400 megawatt gas turbine uses quite a bit of hydrogen but we'll be using it intermittently to back up renewable energy. Whereas in the transportation side, each, each fuel, cell, fuel, uh, fuel cell vehicle and charging station will not use quite as much, uh, not as quite as energy intensive, but we'll be utilizing that energy around the clock. So this idea of, of cross-sector coupling is extremely important as we look at hydrogen and collaboration. And as Janice will speak to with the High Deal LA, the idea of these, this hub approach was, is critical in, in moving hydrogen fuel forward, at least in the minds of, of this issue power. But we shouldn't forget that we also have technologies like carbon capture utilization storage. This is technology that Mitsubishi Power has regularly deployed on schedule on, and on budget. And so we, we are excited about the idea of, of blue hydrogen where on the case-by-case -case basis where, where it makes sense. So as we look at the carbon sector index, we, we, we founded this study by Carnegie Mellon University to really look at where we've gone already with, with um, our, our carbon production. And we can already say we're 40% 40, 40 below the 2001 levels of carbon. That's mostly due to, to cheap uh, natural gas and the implementation of, of massive amounts of solar and wind. But as we look at what this looks like going forward and how do we get to these zero carbon numbers that we're all uh, charging towards, we will be doing that with low cost of, of store, uh, storage lithium ion battery solutions on the short duration side. So we're seeing a, a, a massive growth of that. But as we move forward here, we really believe that hydrogen will play an important role in that segment. So quickly here, going into an, a study that Mitsubishi Power conducted internally using a um, Plexus model that most of, the, uh, most of the utilities utilize for their IRP planning, we looked at a, a, a grid with and without hydrogen. And the key takeaways here are, first of all, we couldn't get the model to converge without the use of hydrogen. You see massive overgeneration, massive curtailment. And as we move into a, a pro-hydrogen scenario where we utilize hydrogen, you can see the grid is more, more, more efficiently built out. So we see what comes out to be a 20% lower system cost to reach net zero hydrogen, which is kind of counterintuitive when people think of hydrogen as being a very expensive infrastructure. That is true. But if we think about the massive over build out that would be needed to reach carbon zero without the use of hydrogen as a long duration storage medium, that, um, that system cost it winds up actually being more expensive. And so as we look at how that operates out throughout the year, we see hydrogen charging and discharging during just different parts of the year. And this is what we can accomplish with, with battery solution alone. Now, you know, battery will help us with the intraday market, shifting power around from afternoons to, to, to evenings. But as we look at this, this idea of shifting throughout the year, this, will, this is where hydrogen really play an important role. And our, our modeling has really supported that evidence that you know, in the winter months that we will be you know, soaring hydrogen through the spring and then utilizing that hydrogen in the summer months when we have more energy intensive. Sorry, I talked really fast. I know I only had a few minutes to go through this, but uh, looking forward to the Q&A after. Thank you, Janice, appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. So um, without further ado, let's move on to Dexter for your opening comments. Dexter, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Let me share my screen here. Almost there. All right, how's that look, Janice? It looks great. Great. So I'm Dexter Gauntlet. I'm the uh, head of utility advisory here based in Portland, Oregon. I work in actually the uh, smart mobility office of Panasonic. And uh, I've been asked to participate in this because we see um, hydrogen increasingly with our utility work and uh, Panasonic's commitment uh, to clean energy, as we stated here, is to um, produce more energy um, than 100% clean energy than it actually uses across its facilities. We're in our Renewable Energy 100 member, and we're starting to increase our commitment um, uh, I'm going to cover some of the activities we're doing in Japan, but also how that work is translating to our work here in the U.S. as well. 
so our division actually um what's really interesting i think about panasonic uh is how we are coming from a hardware perspective uh which is what we're known for um however uh as we move into the u.s market and particularly our work with utilities um it's been a bit of an education in terms of how um a hardware company can actually make it into a rapidly evolving rapidly transformational space like uh, the utility sector and so we're really nestling ourselves with a a handful of really progressive um i would say you know very committed utilities um we're working with pge excel colorado springs tampa electric um at this kind of nexus of uh, the utility, the energy world, the mobility side, and the smart and connected. And if I really, to sum it up, we're really here to help um, utilities transform, not only from a technological perspective, which is really only 50% of the equation, but the other 50% is really the uh, regulatory navigating that whole process. And so we've built this really incredible team of technologists, of course, which we are known for, but also now combining them with a lot of the utility regulatory experts. And so together, we're working from the same side of the table as utilities to help them accelerate adoption of clean energy technologies, not only distributed energy, um, you know, solar, batteries, um, fuel cells, but also things like transportation electrification. And what we're learning is some of the tools and solutions that we're coming up with in the electrification side of um, transportation will have direct dividends um, in terms of how we uh, can enable hydrogen as well. So with that, a quick summary of what we're doing here. Panasonic is actually building out at its um, hydrogen fuel cell uh, manufacturing facility in Japan a um, solar battery fuel cell microgrid, and this is in Kusatsu. And here you can see the peak power, 680 kW, uh, with lithium ion battery and hydrogen fuel cells, 500 kW. This will be commissioned in April, 2022. And it's an opportunity for us to uh, explore the use of this more, um, this broader, uh, larger scale uh, distributed fuel cell system. Now, as you'll know, uh, if you've been living in Japan, it sounds like half of the audience is in Japan, uh, Panasonic is an absolute leader in fuel cells, where we have about half of the market share from the NFARM program. Uh, as of April 2021, 200,000 units, which is just over half of the total units deployed as part of that program. So we know the market really well there. Um, the next generation of hydrogen fuel cells Panasonic is working on, uh, pure hydrogen, switching away from natural gas-based fuel cells. This is what customers demand and what our climate is requiring. And the ability to scale beyond just the residential side. So as you know, we've started with the smaller units and now in a couple of specific uh, case studies and in, in smart city applications here in these pilot programs in Harumi Flag Project, we're um, increasing that to 30 kW, eventually up to 300 kW, and then eventually one megawatt in the future. So again, this is kind of the, um, uh, to use the old term, the silver buckshot approach here. We know that the future is going to be a combination of all of these distributed energy technologies and fuel cells have an important role. Um, ultimately, we know again though, that the go-to-market strategy matters. In the US market in particular, you cannot just have an, uh, the best technology in and of by itself. Panasonic does produce the best technology. However, it's a much more complicated ecosystem in the United States. And that kind of um, close relationship with utilities and close relationship with customer that, that we bring is enabling us to build this kind of ecosystem of, of partners working throughout the value chain. So that's what we are here to um, take a longer term approach to in the US. My final slide here, uh, representing again, the utility perspective. I'm a uh, utility guy, um, really focused on new business models. And again, I can't understate the importance of uh, supporting utilities um, through this process and how important that is. If you're a hardware uh, producing company, you can't just expect it to be adopted just because it's a good technology. You have to understand the local regulations. You have to understand how each utility, what their priorities are, and how you can make it a win-win, not only for the utility for them and their customers, uh, but also to fit in this regulatory um, system. Uh, 
Um, here is a, on the left here, we see a lot of the announcements uh, that utilities have been active with, active with um, really focused on centralized generation, uh, as was mentioned, long duration and seasonal energy storage. But also over time, we're going to start to see this distributed energy uh, a place as well, uh, play a larger role as well. And so we saw the Earthshot Awards, 50 million for 31 projects around next generation high, clean hydrogen technologies. Again, fuel cells will gain market acceptance here, but will require utilities to continue facilitating distributed energy resources more broadly. So we all know solar and storage are the king right now. Um, but as we uh, expand the more of the industrial sector to decarbonize fuel cells in particular will play a strong role there. So I'll um, look forward to the discussion later. Thank you, Dexter. It was a very informative presentation and a great setup for our next speaker, who's a utility executive. I'd like to cede the floor to Marty Adams, General Manager of LADWP. Janice, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with everyone. I know you've all had a long afternoon. And I hope that this panel uh, proves to be a good wrap up for the day. So uh, I head up the largest municipal utility in the nation. That's the LA Department of Water and Power. Uh, just for reference, if you're not familiar with Los Angeles, we're the second largest city in the country with about 4 million residents. Uh, our water and power service is just the city of LA, but the city of LA itself is one of the biggest economic drivers in the world. It encompasses almost 500 square miles of area. And we actually, in our power supply, for reference, we get power from currently five different states that we bring into Southern California, into the Los Angeles region uh, to supply power to drive the city. So I want to just take, take you on a little, little path quickly to tell you how hydrogen is going to play a key role in the future for the city of Los Angeles power supply. Uh, Peter uh, mentioned uh, Intermountain Power Project, which currently is a very large coal plant in Delta, Utah, uh, many hundred miles uh, to the east of us. And that coal plant is going away and becoming a natural gas plant. But during that transition to natural gas, the new plant will also be constructed so as to use hydrogen. And on day one in 2025, when it turns on, we will be ready and capable and have the supply to burn 30% hydrogen blend with our natural gas. And the, in Delta, Utah, we have a very uh, unique situation. We have plenty of land for electrolysis. We have that to set up all the, all the systems we need. We have plenty of water supply to convert to hydrogen, and we also have an underground salt dome uh, rock formation, which allows us a really unique opportunity to store hydrogen. And so what we're looking at is this green hub in Utah, where excess renewable energy, particularly solar and sometimes wind at night, uh, which happens a lot. And a lot of times if we look at the number of megawatts around the world that are turned off, especially in the spring and fall months, putting that energy to use to create green hydrogen. So that's clean hydrogen created by, by electrolysis and then store it for when we need it and burn it in a conventional power plant uh, along with conventional natural gas. Eventually, as we do regular upgrades to the plant, burning 100% uh, green hydrogen. And so that's the project that really got us started on, started on the hydrogen pathway. But then we come to Los Angeles and we look at reliability of the electric grid and how hydrogen plays such a critical role for us. We did the most comprehensive study known uh, by NREL, the National Renewable Electricity Lab, uh, the most detailed study looking at what the future needs would be in Los Angeles to have a clean energy grid. And through millions of runs and models that they ran for us in conjunction with our own staff and a large group of stakeholders that helped to advise this effort, we came up with a, with a plan, a set of options for how to get to the future, how to get to a clean energy future that was reliable and dependable for the city of Los Angeles. One of the key things we learned in that study is that we still need at least 2,500 megawatts of in-basin, in-LA basin generation in order for the grid to be reliable. And we have four power plants in the LA basin. We have three on the coast and one inland. They currently have a capacity of about 3,400 megawatts. And so we're looking at most of that, and some models actually show even more than that in the future being needed to make the grid reliable. The challenge for us is that we need to repower or rebuild three of those power plants that sit on the coast that use water that comes in the power plant for once through cooling. It, it takes water in, puts it back out to the ocean because of the impact on marine life. So we find ourselves at a confluence of several different rules going on. We find that we cannot do once through cooling in the very near future. We have to change these power plants out. 
We also find that we need to get away from burning gas and we need to burn something cleaner. Uh, and green hydrogen would be that solution, non-polluting, non-carbon producing. And we also find out that we have to have power plants in the LA Basin. And so the only solution that we know and we see at this time is to burn hydrogen. And for us, that means burning green hydrogen. And so while we were working on a large project in Delta, Utah, we have a suite of projects right here in the Los Angeles basin, right here in the city of LA in the San Fernando Valley, which will dwarf the project in Delta, Utah in the future. We will need to have four power plants where we have existing uh, hubs of energy, existing transmission, and those four power plants will have to have a number of power generating units that burn green hydrogen in the future in order to have a sustainable electrical grid and provide the kind of power supply that the city needs for the future and have a green supply. So it's a very interesting situation where different forces are coming together, including the city's own committed goal to be carbon free by 2035. And we have deadlines before 2030 to rebuild these power plants. So we are on a crash course to recreate a new power system in Los Angeles, a new generating system to feed the electrical grid that we have. And we see green hydrogen as a solution to do that. And the only way that we know to accomplish the reliability that we need uh, have, you know, we can have solar and wind, but have guaranteed power all the time under every situation and every kind of outage that we endure in the power system as an energy provider, that it's the only way we can do that and, and do it in the clean uh, fashion. One nice thing about being a municipal utility is that for us, we're listening to our ratepayers. Our ratepayers are the general public, and they're telling us they want a clean energy future. So we're not worried about ratepayers or return on investment. We're worried about properly investing ratepayer dollars for the clean energy future that they want. So here, a municipal utility owned by the people of Los Angeles will be driving the future and driving a green hydrogen economy here in the LA Basin. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, and thanks for your leadership. Um, I, uh, I just want to build on what you shared and perhaps share with our audience today the vision that your leadership is enabling. It's sort of like the, the spark. <laughs> it's going to get things going in the LA Basin. So um, I'd like to just share my screen here. Give me one sec. All right. Okay. All right, and I just wanted to share one slide, which is a picture. You know, the question is, that's a lot of hydrogen that's going to be needed in the LA Basin that uh, Marty shared. And um, together with LADWP and a number of other stakeholders in Hydeal LA, um, we undertook a study to um, share, uh, to figure out, is this possible? And can we achieve mass scale, low cost delivered green hydrogen to the LA basin? We call this effort High Deal LA. And there's a lot of information about this on the website, the Green Hydrogen Coalition website. But I wanted to share with you the vision of what we found. So this was an intense four month study. Uh, Mitsubishi was also involved and a number of other ecosystem stakeholders. And the short answer is that yes, we can achieve under $2 per kilogram delivered mass scale green hydrogen. This is feasible before 2030. And uh, it's a bit of a misnomer. We call it Hydeal LA. It should really be called Hydeal Southwest because what we're talking about is a regional hub that envisions off takers in Southern California and connects by a 100% hydrogen pipeline to uh, large geologic salt dome formations in central Utah. Um, and that pipeline enables a regional hub that spans California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Um, just in the interest of time, um, this was an end-to-end -end planning study, and we found that we could achieve under $2 per kilogram delivered for quantities on the order of 1 to 3 million metric tons. And this is a mass scale um, vision. And in the course of this effort, it was multi-sectoral. We interviewed many other off-takers and found that particularly the diesel users in and around Southern California would much more quickly switch out their diesel equipment to fuel cell-based equipment if they had visibility into mass scale supply. So um, this is the missing link and we're moving forward with phase two of this work. And I invite everybody on this call to collaborate 
We're very excited about closer collaboration with Japan on the technology front. And also because someday we're envisioning that this vision um, could uh, in, uh, involve um, not only decarbonization of multiple sectors, but aviation, shipping, also the export of large quantities of low cost green hydrogen to Japan. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, I know we have uh, questions coming in from the audience, which I'm gonna bring up. And uh, sorry about that, I shared the presenter view. <laughs> but I'd love to you know, just kick off this conversation. And um, we heard in other panels that, um, mass scale, you know, deliver, achieving large volumes of hydrogen is key. And we heard that scale is the key to driving down cost. And just, you know, maybe Marty, just for perspective, um, I, I, either you or Peter, I'm wondering if you can comment on like how much hydrogen is actually needed. Maybe take IPP as an example. What are we talking about per year in terms of demand uh, and uh, just just um, for perspective, since we've been talking about all these other applications. You know, Peter's the, the power plant expert, so I'm going to defer to him on how much hydrogen is needed in terms of volumes. But I will tell you what, was what I was enthused by by the other speakers today was the fact that there are these other sectors that, that are going to be developed right around us to use hydrogen. And so... You know, it's this coming together of all these uses that's going to make the difference. And I think, um, you know, that that's where we really got to band together because that's where we'll see the economy of scale. Uh, and if we all go independently, then we're all going to suffer independently. If we go together, we'll win together. So, Peter, how are you on volumes there? Yeah, so modern combined cycle gas turbine, you know, not specific to, to the IPP project, is somewhere in the order of 600 tons per day. And what we're looking at, as Marty mentioned, you know, this cross, idea of cross-sector coupling is critical because if you're looking at, you know, a typical hydrogen fueling station, that's five tons per day. But the usage rate is very different. Excuse me. The use case is very different. So what we really want to do is, as we're implementing all these electrolyzers, installing all these electrolyzers, we really want to get those capacity factors as high as we can so we can really maximize the, the usage of that. So in doing so, we, we bring the sectors together and we can really maximize the, the capacity factors and really deploy that capital efficiently. Thanks. And we have, um, you know, the possibility to, as you said, bring together all these different applications to optimize that capacity factor and to be able to afford infrastructure that will enable really low delivered cost. And I'm wondering, um, Marty, if you could speak to, you mentioned that IPP has like a lot of really important factors out there that are enabling the conversion of intermountain power, which is exciting. You mentioned the salt dome, it's a conversion. We have water resources, renewable energy resources. How are those, um, that situation, like what, how, how are you thinking about the vision of replicating that um, in the LA basin? And, and, um, uh, and how are, what are the opportunities I would say um, specifically, because we've heard um, from the transportation sector panel, um, we've heard about fuel cells, you know, speak to, share more about your vision of what that would look like in LA. So, you know, this is a, it's an interesting challenge. As you said, at IPP in Utah, yeah. um, literally the salt dome is across the street. And so we have everything we need, you know, it's like real estate, location, 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 right? So this is, that is the perfect setup for a, a big hydrogen project, kind of first of its kind at that scale. But now when you bring it into an urban area, it's a whole different ballgame. You know, we don't have uh, the same structures, geologic structures underground to store the hydrogen. And so there becomes a question, earlier conversations about are we shipping hydrogen as a gas? Is it shipped as a liquid? Do we ship it as ammonia? And so we need to decide, you know, what does the delivery pipeline look like? And where are we going to hold it? I, we're, I'm going to run a power system. And I'm going to generate power using hydrogen. I don't want to be in the business of generating hydrogen. And I like to deal with it and handle it as little as possible. Because right now, I bring in natural gas and I just have a service connection. I handle it as little as possible. So if I have to get in the ammonia game and other things, it's a different deal for, for a utility. So we really need to look at what does that end use look like? And then how does it get around? 
And of course, in you know, you talk about about making hydrogen. The hardest part is getting it places, and and piping is 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 tough. And when you're in an urban setting, it's it's disruptive, it's expensive. Uh, when I look look at what happened when recycled water, which is now very popular over the world, when recycled water came into being. A lot of places looked at how much money that costs. And some people spend a lot of money on recycled water that'll never pay for itself. Other times people looked at green belt areas. Where are there a confluence of users? Where is there a golf course and a cemetery and, and a park that are close together? So it makes that pipe affordable. So now just roll that forward to hydrogen. Where are those users located? Are there enough along one particular line? or one general area where we can then co-invest in the facilities, the pipelines needed to bring that hydrogen. And I think that that's where we have to tie the users together because that's the opportunity. The opportunity is if we're the first ones going in, we're gonna pay a lot of money for hydrogen. We're gonna be really dis disinclined to even use it. Um, and, and it may be unaffordable for the people of Los Angeles. And so we need to partner with other users to make sure that the infrastructure we need gets constructed. And we have to do it in a smart way. We can build it one, you know, one pipe going one direction at a time. I did not know that in the LA basin, there's 60 miles of hydrogen piping running in the harbor area between uh, certain vendors and oil refineries. How do we parlay into that? How do we get that hydrogen become green hydrogen instead of the gray hydrogen it is today? How do we get it from green hydrogen and how do we build out that system? How do we take advantage of that infrastructure? And so that's the key because anything in the ground that's hard scale construction, that's where the money really, really comes to play. And that's where we need to really leverage our cooperation together. Thanks, Marty. And that's really big scale. And I, you know, um, the opportunity is very exciting. There is this other infrastructure called the electric power infrastructure, which may be able to produce hydrogen in local pockets and with fuel cells, um, provide resilient power. And Dexter, I'm wondering if you could comment from the fuel cell perspective, the applications that you see and what some of the barriers are to that use. Uh, I know you've made a ton of progress on that in Japan. How could we go faster here in North America? Oh, wow. So, um, you know, I, if I'm being honest, I, my background is really as an analyst. And I started as a solar analyst and then moved into battery and then electric vehicle. Fuel cells 15 years ago were the technology that was 15 years out. And I'm, I'm happy to be here in you know, 2021 and see that they're actually here today. And we've got leaders like Marty and Peter really you know, helping to make it happen and Panasonic in Japan. Now the US market is just a completely different animal than a lot of than, than Europe and then in, in Asia. And it's gonna be really difficult, even in a combined heat and power application for fuel cells to really um, get on the radar first of purchasing uh, managers, uh, particularly in industrial facilities that you know, there is the primary application that I see um, as making the most sense soonest. Um, you know, we've seen some traction with data centers, um, but it's gonna require policy. And that is what we're seeing. And this is actually kind of an interesting segue into the infrastructure bill where there was, uh, I think I read something like $8 billion for these clean energy hubs and another billion dollars for electrolyzer specific research. And it's honestly gonna take political willpower for this to happen at the high level. And um, again, it's, uh, there is no other option other than to include hydrogen in, in that. Um, and I think that fuel cells is gonna be one of those boats that rides with the tide. Um, it's not gonna be a, um, solar and storage are just so cost effective in the US and those costs have plummeted so much. Um, and in markets like Japan and Europe where there may be larger fuel cell application, they've been highly subsidized um, and the high cost of electricity and natural gas compared to the US. We are low cost electricity, low cost of natural gas, so it's really hard to displace that. And as a result, fuel cells in particular are going to have a very niche market. And policy, again, will have to be the driver for a lot of these. Thanks for that segue, Dexter. And I'm realizing we're rapidly running out of time. And I wanted to, where I wanted to go was to address some of the other barriers, but I'm told we only have five minutes left. So I'm gonna ask each one of you um, to take a minute, minute and a half, to think about the biggest barrier that this international collaboration platform can help remedy, right? We have two great nations, Japan and the United States. 
um, on this call, lots of representatives from all over the world. Um, so when you think about the barriers before us and how we can achieve a clean and green uh, hydrogen economy um, for all, what is, what is that main barrier? And please provide one actionable international collaboration recommendation so that we can advance uh, a clean hydrogen economy for grid reliability and help accelerate U.S. mass scale someday export of clean green hydrogen to Japan. So who wants to go first? I guess I'll, I'll jump in first here. So yeah, I mean, working for Mitsubishi Power, I've, I've kind of, you know, Mitsubishi has a bit of a head start on everyone with hydrogen. As you know, uh, Japan is resource constrained, has been looking at its decarbonization targets for a while and looking at how to import uh, new green energy into, into Japan. So hydrogen has been on the radar for quite some time. The idea, idea of a hydrogen economy has been on the radar for some time. So fortunately, you know, for us, uh, as far as technology is concerned, we're really getting a jump start. But really, as we're looking to to bring the two nations together, I think, you know, specifically for us as a as an OEM, just the sharing of technology as we as we try to drive the markets forward and understanding the, the collaboration between those those technologies and the need for advancing those technologies uh, in a more rapid pace. Dexter, why don't we go um, right down the line and then we'll close out with Marty. Oh man, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, there's no just one thing. Uh, uh, okay, let's be super narrow. So um, the regulatory environment uh, that utilities have to operate within is extremely slow paced. And there's some great, you know, sta um, the state targets that are being set, you know, California, Oregon, really expressing leadership, Washington, of course, um, on the West Coast here and many other states. Um, now, that same kind of urgency that's being very clearly articulated at the state level needs to follow through in the mechanisms at the regulatory level that will allow rapid adoption of this. We can no longer have a regulatory environment that is business as usual. Um, we need, they need more resources and they need to uh, work with the utilities and utilities need to kind of do a little house cleaning themselves, if we're being honest, in terms of um, moving things forward more quickly. And I think that is, that's the number one challenge that we're working on. Can you give us one example of a regulatory item that needs follow through, just so we can all crystallize in our minds what you mean? Yeah, I think if, if we're, again, being really honest, all a lot of this has to do with what the utility is allowed to earn on. Uh, so what are their, um, what are the ways that they can continue to operate financially viable, earn their, you know, regulated rate of return um, without, of course, gouging customers? That has been the number one mm -hmm. problem is that utilities don't see a way they can profit. And so they're going to put the brakes on it, put the brakes on it, put the brakes on it until the regulation allows them to earn on certain pieces of it. And that's just the cold, hard reality. Thanks for that, Dexter. Marty, well, international I, collaboration recommendation. I agree, I agree with my colleagues. So here's, here's one of the things that I challenge. I get challenged all the time. People say, well, we've heard of hydrogen before. It's come around in years past. I think that we believe that we're at the tipping point, that the momentum has changed, and this time it's for real. But convincing people this is for real. So part of the things we need to do is, you know, we need to understand, get people to understand more feasibly about hydrogen. You know, it's not the Hindenburg. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's being used currently. There's hundreds of miles of hydrogen piping in the, you know, the Southern United States. It's dealt with safely. Uh, and so I think there's a technical aspect. People have to understand to get familiar with it. There's a lot of things that we deal with that are dangerous or perceived as dangerous. Every day we deal with this gasoline, you know, all sorts of things. And, and we're used to it. And so I need people to get used to the hydrogen and I used to the idea of hydrogen so it can become commonplace in people's minds. Now, from a technical standpoint, how that works, I'm not sure. But I think the dialogue, I think that when we find companies putting out products, we find pilot plants, we find examples of it being used, we know that we want to go to green hydrogen. Um, there may be some other colors in the rainbow that we get there in the meantime, but I need to see some hydrogen being used right now to show people that this works, technology is real, it can be used, it can be the fuel of the future. And so um, anytime there's an example of hydrogen in use, 
um, particularly in use in a combustion form for me, that is hugely important to show people this is actually reality. It does actually work. It can actually replace the carbon producing fuels that we have now. Thanks, Marty. And I, I'd, uh, you know, so grateful to all of you. I, my uh, moderator's <laughs> prerogative, I just want to build on this idea for my one recommendation is I think there's tremendous opportunity for the U.S. and Japan, California and Japan to collaborate to start putting that infrastructure in the ground right now. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time to get that hydrogen pipeline in place, but there's no reason we can't say move forward with a significant commercial scale, say electrolysis demonstration right there in the port of LA to demonstrate multi-sectoral use to supply some green hydrogen using LADWP's electric system, for example, bringing in green electrons, super cheap green electrons from uh, the Southwest regional part of the United States to produce green hydrogen to serve power plants, fueling stations, maybe some cargo handling equipment. We heard from the Port of Long Beach earlier today, even aviation. Um, we are this close to launching all renewable green hydrogen flight here in California. And this is a project that I couldn't imagine a better collaboration um, that could be launched. So thank you all um, three of you, four of you. Thank you, Talk, for allowing us to close out today's session. And uh, thank you for uh, the audience for listening in. Thanks a lot, Janice. Uh, that wraps up our panel discussion on fuel cells and hydrogen power generation. Thank you, Mr. Gauntlet, Mr. Sawicki, Mr. Adams for your valuable insight and a lively discussion. Thanks also to our moderator, Ms. Lim, and to the audience for all the great questions. Thank you. And with that, it's time to bring the second session of our two-day conference to a close. On behalf of Nido and Jetro, I'd like to thank all of our special guests and participants who have made this event possible with their time, perspectives, insight, and lively discussions, and to our moderators for keeping the panels moving smoothly. Thanks are also due to the representatives of the state of California, Oregon, Washington, and the province of British Columbia for their support and commitment to a clean energy future. Finally, thank you to our audience for attending and providing all of the great questions. We hope that this conference has been valuable to you and that you come away from it with a deeper understanding, new connections and ideas. A questionnaire will appear on the screen when you leave the seminar. We will greatly appreciate it if you could cooperate with that. Thanks again and have a great evening. ねえと。